Playbook presenting you, The Heaven Earth Grocery Store, a novel by James McBride. James McBride is the author of the New York Times best-selling Oprah's Book Club selection Deacon King Kong, the National Book Award winning The Good Lord Bird, the American classic The Color of Water, the novel's song yet sung and miracle at St. Anna, the story collection Five Carat Soul, and Kill, M and Leave, a biography of James Brown. The recipient of a National Humanities Medal and an accomplished musician, McBride is also a distinguished writer in residence at New York University. Now we should go into the story. 1. The Hurricane Here was an old Jew who lived at the site of the old synagogue up on Chicken Hill in the town of Pottstown, Pa, and Wen, Pennsylvania. State troopers found the skeleton at the bottom of an old well off Hayes Street, the old Jew's house was the first place they went to. This was in June, 1972, the day after a developer tore up the Hayes Street lot to make way for a new townhouse development. We found a belt buckle and a pendant in the well, the cops said, and some old threads from a red costume or jacket, that's what the lab shows. They produced a piece of jewelry, handed it to him, and asked what it was a mezuzah, the old man said. It matches the one on the door, the cops said. Don't these things belong on doors? The old man shrugged. Jewish life is portable, he said. The inscription on the back says, home of the greatest dancer in the world. It, s in Hebrew. You speak Hebrew. Do I look like I speak Swahili? Answer the question. You speak Hebrew or not? I bang my head against it sometimes. And you're Malachi the dancer, right? That, s what they say around here. They say you're a great dancer. Used to be. I gave that up 40 years ago. What about the mezuzah? It matches the one here. Wasn't this the Jewish temple? It was. Who owns it now? Who owns everything around here? The old man said. He nodded at the immense gleaming private school seen through the dim window. The Tucker School. It sat proudly atop the hill behind wrought iron gates, with smooth lawns, tennis courts, and shiny classroom buildings, a monstrous bastion of arrogant elegance, glowing like a phoenix above the ramshackle neighborhood of Chicken Hill. They've been trying to buy me out for thirty years, the old man said. He grinned at the cops, but he was practically toothless, save for a single yellow tooth that hung like a clump of butter from his top gum, which made him look like an aardvark. You're a suspect, they said. Suspect, suspect, he said with a shrug. He was well north of 80, wearing an old grey vest, a rumpled white shirt holding several old pens in the vest pocket, a wrinkled tallet around his shoulders, and equally rumpled old pants, but when he reached inside his pants pocket, his gnarled hands moved with such deftness and speed that the state troopers, who spent most days ticketing tractor trailers on nearby Interstate 76 and impressing pretty housewives during traffic stops with their bubble gum lights and stern lectures about public safety, panicked and stepped back, their hands on their weapons, but the old man produced nothing more than several pens. He offered the cops one. No thanks, they said. They milled around for a while longer and eventually left, promising to return after they pulled the skeleton out of the well and studied the potential. Murder seen some more. They never did, though, because the next day God wrapped his hands around Chicken Hill and wrung his last bit of justice. Out of that wretched place, Hurricane Agnes came along and knocked the power out of four counties. The nearby Schuylkill River rose to a height of seven feet. To hear the old black women of Chicken Hill tell it, white folks was jumping off their rooftops in Pottstown like they was on the Titanic. All those fancy homes down there were swept away like dust. That storm killed everything it touched, drowned every man, woman, and child that come near it, wrecked bridges, knocked down factories, tore up farms, that thing caused millions in damages, millions and millions, that's white folks. Language, millions and millions. Well, for us colored folks on the hill, 
It was. Just another day of dodging the white man's evil. As for the old Jew and his kind that was on this hill, they got all their time back from them that stole everything from M. And the Jew lady they wronged, Miss Chona, she got her justice, too, for the king of kings fixed her up for all the good things. She done, lifted her up and filled up her dreams in an instant in only the way he can. That evil fool who called himself son of man, he's long gone from this country, and that boy Dodo, the deaf one, he's yet living. They put that whole camp up there in Montgomery County now on account of him. The Jews did, theater owners they was, God bless, M, and them cops and big time muckety mucks that was running behind them Jews for the body. They found in that old well, they can't find a speck against, M now, for God. Took the whole business, the water well, the reservoir, the dairy, the skeleton, and every itty bitty thing they called a used against them Jews. And washed it clear into the Manitoni Creek. And from there, every single bit of that who shot John nonsense got thrown into the Schuylkill, and from there, it flowed into the Chesapeake Bay down in Maryland, and from there, out to the Atlantic, and that's where the bones of that rotten scoundrel, whose name is not worthy to be called by my lips is floating to this day, at the bottom of the ocean, with the fish picking his bones and the devil, keeping score, as for old Malachi, the cops never did find him, they come back for him, after the hurricane business died away, but he was long gone, left a sunflower or two in the yard and that, s it, Old Mr. Malachi got off clean. He was the last of M. The last of the Jews round here. That fella was a wizard. He was something. He could dance, too. Lord, that man was magic. Mazel tov, honey. 2. A bad sign. Or t seven years before construction workers discovered the skeleton. In the old farmer's well on Chicken Hill, a Jewish theater manager in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, named Moshe Ludlow had a vision about Moses. Moshe had this vision on a Monday morning in February as he was cleaning out the remnants of a chick web one night stand at his tiny all American dance hall and theater on Main Street. Webb and his roaring 12 piece band was the greatest musical event Moshe had ever witnessed in his life except for the weekend he managed to lure Mickey. Katz, the brilliant but temperamental Yiddish genius of klezmer music, out of Cleveland to play a full weekend of family fun and Yiddish frolic at Moshe's All-American Dance Hall and Theater two months before. Now, that was something. Katz, the kid wizard of clarinet, and his newly formed seven-piece ensemble braved a furious December snowstorm that dropped. 14 inches in the eastern Pennsylvania mountains to make it to the gig. And thanks to Bless GD, they had, because Moshe counted 249 Jewish shoe salesmen, shop owners, tailors, blacksmiths, railroad painters, deli owners, and their wives from five different states, including upstate New York and Maine, who came to the event. There were even four couples from Tennessee who drove through the Blue Ridge Mountains for three days, eating cheese and eggs, unable to keep kosher on the Sabbath, just to be with their fellow Yids, and right before Hanukkah, for which they all should be at home lighting candles for eight days. Not to mention one of the husbands was a fanatic and believed that the fast of Tisha B'Av, normally celebrated in July or August, should be celebrated twice a year instead of once which meant staying home every December and starving and peppering the walls with pictures of flowers for three weeks straight as a show of thanks to the Creator for his generosity in helping the Jewish people of Eastern Europe escape the pogroms for the relative peace and prosperity of America's promised land. Thanks to him and the weather, all four couples were in a foul mood once they arrived, having squeezed into two ancient Packards, one of which had no heat, and driven through the savage snowstorm. They announced plans to leave immediately when they 
heard talk of more snow, but Moshe talked them out of it. That was his gift. Moshe could talk the horns off the devil's head. How many times in life does one get to hear a young genius? He said to them, it will be the greatest event of your life. He led them to his pocket-sized room in a boarding house on Chicken Hill, a tiny area of ramshackle houses and dirt. Roads where the town's blacks, Jews, and immigrant whites who couldn't afford any better lived, set them before his warm wood stove, filled them with warm iced tea and gefilte fish, and amused them with the story of his Romanian grandmother who jumped out a window to avoid marrying a Haskala Jew, only to land atop a Hasidic rabbi from Austria. She knocked him to the mud, he exclaimed. When he looked up, she was reading his palm, so they got married. That brought smirks and chuckles to their faces, because everyone knew. The Romanians were crazy. With their laughter ringing in his ears, he rushed back to the crowd who waited anxiously in the snow for the theater doors to open. As Moshe made his way down the muddy roads of Chicken Hill to his theater on Main Street, his heart sank. The makeshift line that had formed an hour before had exploded into a mob of close to 300. Moreover, he was informed that the temperamental genius Katz had arrived, but was inside the theater in a foul mood, having braved the terrible storm, and was now threatening to leave. Moshe raced inside and found to his relief that his always dependable helper, an old colored man named Nate Timberlin, had settled Katz and his band backstage before the warm wood stove, serving them hot tea in water glasses, fresh kosher eggs, gefilte, fish, and hala bread, all neatly laid out buffet style. The young cats seemed pleased and announced that he and his band would set up as soon as they finished eating. From there, Moshe went back outside to stall the waiting crowd. When he saw that more people were coming, stragglers rushing from the train station carrying satchels and suitcases, he grabbed a stepladder and climbed atop it to address them all. He had never seen so many Jews in one place in America in his life. The reform snobs from Philadelphia were there in button-down shirts, standing next to ironworkers from Pittsburgh, who crowded against socialist railroad men from reading wearing caps, bearing the Pennsylvania Railroad logo, who stood shoulder to shoulder with coal miners with darkened faces from Uniontown and Spring City. Some were with wives, others were with women who, given their fur coats, leather boots, and dazzling hairdos, were not wives at all. One fellow was, accompanied by a blonde boy six inches taller than him, clad in gay Irish. Green, complete with a hat that looked like a cross between a clover leaf and the spikes on the Statue of Liberty's crown. Some yammered in German, others chatted in Yiddish. Some yelled in a Bavarian dialect, others spoke Polish. When Moshe announced there would be a short delay, the crowd grew more restless. A handsome young Hasid in a kaftan and fur hat, bearing a gunny sack. His curly hair jammed into the hat he wore cocked to the side as if it were a fedora, announced he had come all the way from Pittsburgh and would not dance with a woman at all, which caused laughter and a few harsh words some of them in German, about Polish morons dressing like greenhorns. Moshe was flummoxed. Why come to a dance if you're not going to dance with a woman? He asked the man. I'm not looking for a dancer, the handsome Hassid said tersely. I'm looking for a wife. The crowd laughed again. Later, under the spell of Katz's gorgeous musical wizardry, Moshe watched in wonder as the man danced like a demon all night. He frolicked through every dance step that Moshe had ever seen, and Moshe, who had spent his childhood as a fuzzgayer, a wandering Jew, in Romania, had seen a few horrors, bulgars, cosidals, frailics, Russian marches, Cossack high steps. The Hasid was a wonder of twisted elbows, a rhythmic gyroscope of elastic grace and wild dexterity. He danced with any woman who came close, and there were plenty. Moshe later decided the guy must be some kind of wizard. 
the next four nights with a most extraordinary gathering of joyful Jewish celebration that Moshe had ever seen. He considered it a miracle, in part because the whole business had nearly fallen apart before it even got off the ground, thanks to a series of flyer notices he'd sent out weeks before to drum up advance ticket sales, using a Jewish cross directory that listed synagogues and private homes where traveling Jews could stay, Moshe sent flyers to every country Jewish synagogue, boarding house, and hostel between North Carolina and Maine. The flyers, proudly proclaiming that the great Mickey Katz Road show of winter Yiddish fun and family memories from the old country was coming to the all-American dance hall and theater in Potsdam, Pa, on December 15th, were printed in four languages, German, Yiddish, Hebrew, and English. But Moshe had badly overestimated the organizational power of country Jewish rabbis, and most of the notices were lost in the ongoing rush of death notices, bar mitzvah. Commitments, once in a lifetime sales, kosher cow slaughtering requests, talent making services, business dispute refereeing, moral circumcision, mix-ups, and marriage arrangement snafus that were the daily bread and butter of a country rabbi's life. The few souls who had the presence of mind to open Moshe's letters containing the flyers only added to the confusion. For many were fresh immigrants from Eastern Europe who didn't speak English. They considered any letter that bore a typed address some kind of government notice that meant immediate shipment of you, your family, your dog, and your green stamps back to the old country where the Russian soldiers awaited with a special gift for your part in the murder of the Tsar's son, who of course, the Russians had killed themselves and poked his eyes out to boot, but who's asking? So the flyers were tossed. Moreover, Moshe sent the wrong flyers to the wrong congregations. The Yiddish flyers went to German-speaking congregations. The German flyers were sent to Yiddish shuls who despised the German-loving snobs. The Hebrew ads went to Hungarians who everybody knew pretended they couldn't read English unless it referred to Jews as American Israelites. In Hebrew, two English ads went to a Polish congregation in Maine that had vanished, the greenhorns up there likely having frozen their touchesses, often dropped into the ice somewhere. One Baltimore merchant even accidentally forwarded his Yiddish flyer to the advertising department of the Baltimore Sun, which caused a ruckus, the advertising executive being under the impression that the Jewish clothing store merchant from East Baltimore's Jewtown who regularly advertised in the sun intended it for Yiddish-speaking customers only. In actuality, the kind merchant was translating the flyer from Yiddish to English in the back of his store when an argument between two customers broke out in the front of the store. When he stepped out to quell the fuss, his Yiddish-speaking wife wandered into the back storeroom recognized the words, Baltimore Sun, among the papers on her husband's crowded desk, stuffed the half-translated flyer into an envelope along with their weekly advertising check, and mailed it to the paper. The ad executive who received it was too dumb to know the difference between advertising and editorial, and forwarded it to the city desk with a note saying, run this tomorrow because the Jew always pays. Whereupon the Night City editor, a devout well-meaning Catholic, handed it to a new 19-year-old Hungarian copy clerk, hired, in part, because he claimed he could speak Yiddish. The kid sent the whole badly translated mess back to advertising with a note saying, this is an ad. The advertising department placed it in a large font on page B4 on a Saturday. On the last day of Sukkot, the Jewish holiday that celebrates the gathering of the harvest and the miraculous protection the Lord provided for the children of Israel. The result was a disaster. Moshe's original flyer read, in Yiddish, Come see the great Mickey Katz, once in a lifetime event, family fun, and Jewish memories, red hot klezmer like you've never heard before. The translated ad read, in English, Mickey Katz is coming, once a life, 
always alive. Watch the Jews burn, and dance and have fun. The ad caused panic and fury in East Baltimore's Jewtown, as many of its residents still remembered how the town's first rabbi, David Einhorn, spoke out against slavery during the Civil War and was run out of town, his house burned to the ground. They demanded that the merchant close his store and quit the city. Moshe nearly fainted when he got word of the disaster. He sped to Baltimore and spent $400 straightening out matters with the good-natured merchant, who kindly helped him write a second, better ad. But it was too late. The first ad was too much for Baltimore's Jews. It was simply too good to be true. A klezmer dance with the great Mickey Katz. Why would a star like Katz play for poor salesmen and tailors in the freezing hills of eastern Pennsylvania? In an American theater, owned by a Fuzgayer, a Romanian. Fuzgayers don't own theaters. They wander around and sing songs and get the crap beat out of them by the SARS soldiers. Where is Potsdown anyway? Were there any Jews there at all? Impossible. It was a trap. The result was that only four Jewish couples from Baltimore bought advance tickets to see the great cats, and Moshe had been counting on. Baltimore's Jewish community in big numbers. Five weeks before the concert, $1,700 in the hole to his cousin Isaac in Philadelphia, from whom he borrowed the theater rental and deposit money. And feeling lower than he felt when his father died, Moshe dropped to his knees, prayed to GD for spiritual renewal, felt none, and found himself moping around the back storeroom of the Heaven and Earth grocery store the sole Jewish grocery in Chicken Hill. The owner, a rabbi named Yaakov, Floor, felt sorry for the young Romanian and offered to let Moshe study Hebrew from his Talmud, which he kept in the same storeroom where his youngest daughter Chona toiled. She was crippled from polio, with one leg, shorter than the other, requiring her to wear a boot with a sole four inches thick. Chona spent her day sorting vegetables and making butter by stirring yellow dye into creamed milk stored in barrels. Kneading he was up to his balls in hock and kneading GD, Moshe took the rabbi up on the offer and spent several afternoons glumly pouring through the text, thinking of his late father and peeking at Chona, whom he dimly remembered as a quiet, mousy young thing as a child but who now, at age 17, had developed into quite a package. Despite her foot and limp, she was a quiet beauty, with a gorgeous nose and sweet lips, ample breasts, a sizable derriere that poked against the drab, loose-fitting woolen skirt, and eyes that shone with gaiety and mirth. Moshe, at twenty-one, in full bloom himself, found himself looking up several times from his Hebrew studies to gawk at Chona's rear end as she stirred the butter on. Those cold Pennsylvania nights, the swish of her hips moving with the promise of the coal stove in the far corner that heated only half the room. She turned out to be a spirited soul, full of wry humor and glad to have company, and after a few days of easy conversation, regaling him with warm jokes and smiling with her bright gay eyes, young Moshe finally confessed his problem, the upcoming concert, the massive debts, the money. Already spent, the wrong ads, the demands of a difficult star. I'm going to lose everything, he said. It was there, in the back of the rabbi's store, standing over the butter. Barrel, a churn in her hand, that Jonah reminded him of the story of Moses. And the burning coals, she put down her churn, glanced at the door to make sure no one was watching, went to the desk where he sat, lifted her father's dusty, weathered Talmud, which they both knew she was forbidden to touch, grasped the Midrash Raba beneath it, and placed the Talmud back down. Then she opened the Midrash Raba, which contained the five books of Moses, and flipped to the story of Moses and the burning coals. She was a student of religion, she confided, and the story of Moses always brought her solace. It was there, the collapse of his theater imminent, peering at the holy 
Midrash Rabba with one eye and the lovely hand of the beauty Chona with the other, his heart throbbing from the first flush of love, that Moshe first came upon the story of Moses and the burning coals, which Chona read to him in Hebrew, of which he understood every fourth word. Pharaoh placed a plate of burning coals on one side of the infant Moses, and a plate of sparkling coins and jewelry on the other. If the infant was intelligent, he would be attracted to the sparkling gold and jewelry, and would be killed as a threat to the Pharaoh's heir. If he touched the black coals, he would be perceived as too stupid to be a threat and allowed to live. Moses started to reach for the coins, but as he did, an angel appeared and deftly moved his hand to the hot coals, burning his fingers. The child put his fingers in his mouth, stinging his tongue and giving him a lifelong speech impediment. Moses spoke with a defect for the rest of his life, but the life of the leader and most important teacher of the Jewish people was saved. Moshe listened in rapturous silence, and when she was done, he found himself bathed in the light of love only heaven can deliver. He returned to the storeroom for several days, filling himself with words of the Midrash. Rabba, about which he had been previously ambivalent, and the young flower who led him to words of holy purpose. At the end of the third week of Midrash Rabba lessons, Moshe asked Chona to marry him, and to his amazement, she agreed. The next week Moshe deposited $140 in Yaakov's bank account as a gift, then approached Yaakov and his wife with his marriage proposal for their daughter. The parents, both Bulgarian, were so overjoyed that someone other than a cyclops was willing to marry the disabled daughter, so what? If he was Romanian, they readily agreed. Why not next week? Moshe asked. Why not? They said. The modest wedding was held at a habit. Arkham, the tiny shul that serviced Potsdam's 17 Jewish families. It was attended by Moshe's cousin Isaac from Philadelphia, Chona's deliriously happy parents, and a few local Yids Yaakov had drummed up to create the necessary minion of ten Jews to say the seven wedding blessings. Two of them were Polish workers from the Pennsylvania railroad train. Yard who had hustled up to Chicken Hill to grab a kosher bite. The two agreed to attend the wedding but demanded four dollars apiece for cab fare. To Reading, where they were expected to report to work the next morning. Yarkov refused, but Moshe was happy to pay. It was a small price for marrying the woman who brought him more happiness than he ever dreamed possible. So inspired was he by his new love that he forgot all about the $1,700 he'd spent. He sold his car for $350, borrowed another $1,200 from Isaac, and spent the money on ads, this time properly placed, then watched in amazement as ticket sales zoomed. More than 400 tickets were sold for four nights Mickey Katz and his magical musicians poured forth the most rousing, glorious klezmer music that eastern Pennsylvania had ever heard. Four nights of wild, low-down, dance till you can't Jewish revelry. Moshe sold out of everything, drinks, food, eggs, fish. He even put up 20 exhausted New Yorkers in his theater's second-floor balcony, normally reserved for Negroes. The four couples from Tennessee who had threatened to leave stayed the entire weekend, as did the Hasid dancer who swore he would dance with no woman. It was a rousing success. The morning after the festivities ended, Moshe was sweeping the sidewalk in front of his theater when he saw the dancing Hasid hurrying toward the train station. Gone was the fur hat. In its place was a fedora. The kaftan had been cut into a sport coat length jacket. Moshe barely recognized him as the young man approached, Moshe spoke out. Where are you from? He asked. But, the man was fast and silent and already moving down the sidewalk past. Him, Moshe called to his back, wherever you live, it's home to the greatest. Dancer in the world, that's for sure. That did it. The Hasid stopped, reached into his gunny sack, and without 
a word, walked several steps back to Moshe, handed him a bottle of Slivovitz plum brandy, then turned and continued down the sidewalk. Moving fast, Moshe called out cheerfully to his back, Did you find a wife? I don't need a wife, he said, waving a hand without looking back. I'm a twat of love, a what, a sponge cake, he said. Don't you Romanians know anything? Before Moshe could reply, a distinct pop was heard, a tiny explosion like the sound of a cork popping but louder. Both men froze. They looked up at the tiny tangle of houses on Chicken Hill behind Moshe's theater. A small puff of black smoke wafted into the air, apparently from one of the scruffy homes, the smoke vanishing into the sky. That's a bad sign, the Hasid said, then rushed off. Moshe called out, what's your name? But the Hasid was gone. 3. 12. He day after the Hasid left, Moshe walked to his theater to find Nate. Hard at work out front, manning a long-handled grabber, carefully. Pulling the letters off the theater facade. Did you hear that pop yesterday? Moshe asked. It sounded like something blew up on the hill. Nate shrugged, looking up at the facade. Ain't nothing blowing up there. Except hard times. Plenty of that. Moshe laughed. He was still in a glorious mood from the wonderful. Windfall cats had brought him and his recent wedding, so he reached in his pocket, counted off fifteen dollars. For you, he said. Nate, looking up at the facade, glanced down at the money, then shook his head. You don't like my money? Moshe asked. Nate leaned on the long pole. He was a tall, light-skinned man with smooth skin and sinewed, muscled arms from some kind of outdoor work. Moshe guessed. I likes it fine, Nate said. But I like my job more. How I'm gonna keep a job if you keep giving away your last dime, Mr. Moshe, I ain't seen a dance like that since Erskine Hawkins come through Anna Morse's place in Linfield. I used to make good coin over there. Moshe faintly recalled Anna Morse, a well-dressed Negro woman who drove a Packard. He also knew her building, a tiny brick structure on a back road outside Linfield, a farming community about seven miles away. Isn't that a funeral home? He said. It was a colored dance hall, Nate said. But Anna's making more money now from dead bodies than live ones. Shame, too. Colored's got to go all the way to Chambersburg to find a place to dance. Unless you wanna go to a duke joint and get all shot up. Moshe nodded, but his mind began to churn. Later that night, he took the matter to Chona. What if I open my theater to the colored? So, the Goyam won't like that. Chona was standing at the stove cooking dinner, her back to him. She laughed and raised her spoon in the air, spinning it in a circle. That was her gift, not an ounce of bitterness or shred of shame. Unlike Moshe, Chona was an American. She had been born in Potsdam. She was a familiar sight. In Chicken Hill in her worn woolen dress, old sweater, and wearing her special salt boot that cost a fortune, laughing and joking with neighbors. She seemed to know every family. When Moshe came home for lunch and even late at night, he often found his wife standing in front of the store, laughing with one of the local Negroes. That woman, his cousin Isaac, once grumbled, is a real Bulgarian. Whenever they feel like working, they sit and wait till the feeling passes. They can't pour a glass of water without making a party of it. But Isaac was a sourpuss whom Moshe had long ago learned to ignore on certain matters. Standing at her stove, Chona said in Yiddish, Me ken demyam mit a kendal nit ois shepen. You can't ride in all directions at once. What does it matter what they think? The colored's money spends just like ours. Four weeks later, Moshe booked Chick Webb, the colored entertainer. The night of Webb's show, Potsdam's Negroes slipped into Moshe's all-American dance hall and theater-like ghosts. They entered silent and somber, the men in sober suits and ties, the pretty women in flowered dresses and large handsome hats. 
Some were clearly nervous. Others seemed agitated. A few looked outright terrified. Downtown Potsdam was off limits to Negroes unless they came to work as janitors, maids, or to use a public faucet when the tap water on Chicken Hill mysteriously vanished, which was frequently. But once Chick Webb's band struck up, the silent, reticent Negroes of Potsdam transformed, they became a leaping mass of wild, dancing humanity. They frolicked and laughed, dancing as if they were birds, enjoying flight for the first time. Webb's band played like wizards, four sets of gorgeous, stomping, low-down, rip-roaring, heart-racing jazz. The result was an outrageously joyous event, matched in intensity only by the great Mickey Katz affairs. Moshe watched spellbound from the wings as Webb, a tiny man with a curved spine clad in a white suit, roared with laughter and enthusiasm as he played, egging his band on from the rear with his masterful drumming, the thunderous band shaking the floor with rip-roaring waves of gorgeous sound. That man, Moshe decided, was a joymaker, and Moshe could not help but notice that Webb, like his lovely Chona, had a physical disability. Though he was a hunchback of some kind, he moved with a certain feeling of joy, a lightness, as if every moment were precious. Cripples, Moshe thought, have brought me fortune, Moses, Chona, and Chick. It was then that Moshe began to have dreams about Moses. They came in twelves, twelve different visions, twelve different nights, Moses walking through twelve different gates, twelve different cities, Moses on Mount Sinai, staring at twelve different peaks below. He began to see everything about him as a function of twelve, twelve bands in twelve months, twelve hundred dollars invested in twelve different stocks, bringing fantastic returns, even the home he purchased, a tiny brick affair in Chicken Hill, was located in a neighborhood that comprised twelve blocks in one square mile, Moshe told no one about his dreams, not even his wife, instead, he followed the visions, investing first a few pennies in twelve different stocks. Then more as the stocks grew, and in his theater, bringing in twelve different Negro bands in twelve months, including Webb again, who came back for times. The dancers drew Negroes from far and wide, and over the next twelve months, his fortunes grew. As they did, the response of the town's rival theater owners evolved from Crumbles to murmured complaints to roaring outrage. Negroes were crawling all over downtown, they howled, to a Jewish theater. Everybody knows the Jews bake their matzes with Christian blood. The response was swift. First, the city building inspector arrived at the theater and told Moshe his pipes were bad and that his plaster was peeling. And find him. The owner of the theater building complained about the litter. The fire commissioner cited him for creaky doorways and missing emergency exits. Even his own synagogue fined him five dollars. Moshe fought back. He paid off the building inspector. He presented the fire chief, a drunk, with four bottles of scotch and a new fishing rod. He had the ever-faithful Nate and a crew of Negroes sweep the front of every single store on the block. Then he approached the landlord and promised to pay him $150 for every Negro act he booked, offering to buy the building at a substantial price in a year's time if the landlord kept quiet about the Negroes. The landlord agreed to address the synagogue. Isaac traveled up from Philadelphia and met with the Chevry, the men's group that had fined Moshe. Isaac was a grim, forbidding soul, four years older, who'd been Moshe's protector since their shared childhood in Europe. Isaac walked into the meeting, laid a silver dollar on the table, and said, I'll give ten of those to any man in this room who can prove he was at the Mickey Cat's dance with his wife. Not a soul moved. That ended the conversation about Moshe's fine. With the profits from the Negro dances, Moshe bought his theater outright within two years, and then later a second theater two blocks off. 
Over the next five years, he expanded and made real money, enough to buy his mother a warm house in Romania and provide Chona with a comfortable apartment above the heaven and earth grocery store, which he bought from Yakov after Chona's mother passed and Yakov moved on to run a bigger temple in Reading. Moshe planned on demolishing the store, but Chona wouldn't allow it. How can you sell heaven and earth? She laughed. Moshe did not see the humor. You don't have to spend your life selling kosher cow meat and onions to coloreds. Let's close the store. The Jews are leaving the hill. Let's follow them. Where? Down the hill to town. Where the Americans are. Which Americans? Chona, don't be difficult. I'll run the store. How will that look? My wife selling cheese and biscuits while I run one of the best theaters in town. We have plenty now. Chona's exuberant smile molded into a smirk. So I'm to sit home all day while you have fun at your theater full of music. Moshe gave in. It gave the Jewish housewives of Potsdam much to talk about. What kind of husband would let his wife run his business? Why didn't they move off the hill like the other Jews? Her father had moved to Reading after her mother passed. Why hadn't Chona made her husband move there to help her? Father, what's more important than family? But Chona's years of stirring butter, sorting vegetables, and reading in the back room of the heaven and earth grocery store had given her time to consider. She read everything as a child, comics, detective books, dime novels, and by the time she became a young wife, she'd evolved into reading about socialism and unions. She subscribed to Jewish newspapers, publications in Hebrew, and books on Jewish life, some from Europe. The readings gave her wild ideas about art, music, and worldly matters. She knew more Hebrew than any Jewish woman in town, many of whom had little more than a rudimentary knowledge of the language. She could recite the Talmud better than most of the men in shul. Instead of sitting with the women in the balcony, she insisted on davening downstairs with the men. Claiming her bad foot prevented her from climbing stairs. Someone in the temple had the bright idea to at least construct a curtain to separate her from the men in the congregation. Like most ideas in the Ahavit Arkham congregation of Potsdam, that, too, proved to be a disaster, for after Chona's father departed, he was replaced by a fumbling but well-meaning bumbler named Karl Feldman, who spoke with a lisp and whom the congregation called Fertzel, fart, behind his back. Many a morning the hapless Feldman would find his garbled interpretations of Jewish law, amended by the pretty housewife whose sharp Talmudic corrections from behind the curtain fluttered into the air like butterflies as she piped out. Carl, what are you talking about? There are four different versions of how Cain died. Moreover, her lovely singing voice would occasionally break in to help Feldman's faltering cantoring that mangled the glorious Talmudic melodies. Everyone knew women weren't supposed to be cantors, yet Chona's lovely voice brought smiles of relief to even the crankiest congregants. Chona's misbehavior was tolerated by the Ahavit Arkham congregation. Her father had been the town's first rabbi. He'd built the shul. Most congregants had grown accustomed to her craziness. Even Irv and Marvin Skropskillis, the grim identical twins from Lithuania who ran Potsdam's shoe store and fought about everything, loved Chona. She was one of the few things the two agreed about, and everybody knew those two were the most disagreeable Jews in town. Besides, Irv pointed out, cantoring is the cry of Zion, and with Fertzel, that's what you get crying. The two were outspoken in their belief that America was a land where Jews of all types should be of one voice. Why not let the prettiest voice be heard? Still, Moshe pleaded with his wife, Chona, do you have to carry on in shul all the time? Cantoring is Fertzel's, Carl's, job. She waved him off. There are hobos in Chicken Hill who know more Hebrew than Fertzel. Read the book of Moses. Moshe was afraid to tell his wife of his twelve dreams of Moses. He 
assumed his dreams were somehow unholy, a superstition from his Romanian past, and felt his American-born wife would not approve. She would correct him, and he felt no need to be corrected. He had money now. He was an American. He was paying for her store, which was, financially, a bona fide loser. As the months passed and the Jews continued their flight from Chicken Hill, Moshe kept pressing his wife about moving. There are better homes. Downtown, he argued, better lighting, richer customers. We can open a profitable store downtown, he insisted. Chona, light-hearted as always, refused. We have wonderful neighbors, she said. Finally, Moshe confessed to her about seeing the black cloud. There was an explosion on the hill somewhere behind the theater after the Mickey. Cat's dance. The amazing dancer, he saw it, too. He said it was a bad omen. I'm afraid he might be right. Superstition, Chona scoffed with a firmness that ended the discussion. Moshe let the matter drop. He forgot about the Hasid's prediction, gave up the idea of closing Chona's store, and pushed forward. Besides, life was good. Profits were made. He kept his two theaters filled with lively Yiddish bands, Jewish theater troops, and romping, stomping black jazz bands. He worked hard to keep up appearances and to keep from getting thrown out of town, for his wife wrote letters every month to the Potsdam Mercury about Jewish causes and union meetings. She even wrote an angry letter, protesting the annual parade of the Ku Klux Klan in which she announced she knew exactly who one of the head marchers was. She could tell, she wrote, by the way he walked. That was a dangerous letter, Moshe declared. And the two argued about it, for the telltale limp belonged to the town's physician, Doc Roberts, who was well connected with the town's power brokers. To make peace with the town powers, every month also Moshe booked a bevy of terrible bands that Potsdam's high class, pasty faced Presbyterians enjoyed, just to keep the peace, the colonial dames of America, the Pennsylvania Potting Club, the Nineteen Mountain People, whose fourteenth cousin arrived on the Mayflower. The bands were horrible outfits that sounded like owls hooting. Moshe watched in puzzlement as these Americans danced with clumsy satisfaction at the moans and groans of these boneless, noise-producing junkmongers, their boring Humpty Dumpty sounds landing on the dance floor with all the power of empty peanut shells tossed in the air. The couples moved in sad circles holding hands like children, dancing in silence, the women clomping about in wooden clogs no self-respecting Jewish woman would wear, the businessmen swaying in top hats and bow ties from years of yore. Each event was interrupted by heartfelt speeches about the town's founder, the great John Potts, whose portrait loomed in every town building, the old man's face peering over every citizen's shoulder like a ghost taking attendance. Thoughts like this made Moshe feel ashamed of himself. He was a successful American. The country had been good to him. Yet he still believed in sorcery and witchery and the stupid business of twelves. This is old thinking in a new time, he told himself, and I must change. By 1935, eleven years after his initial Mickey Cat success, when his cousin Isaac wrote to him saying he'd bought a brand new Packard, Moshe had had enough. After dinner one night at the kitchen table, he drilled the matter home. We don't need to live above a grocery store anymore. We can have our own house. We are moving. Where? Chona asked. Downtown. To a new house. We'll put a new grocery store near it. I've already made a deposit. Go get your money back. I will not. Then enjoy yourself there, Chona said. I will visit you from time to time. She sat at the table calmly, her fine features determined. And once again, his love for her was too strong. The idea of parking his big Packard. In front of an empty house without his Chona terrified him, and his resolve broke. Chona, please, I do not want a house downtown. I do not want a store downtown. 
Living up here and going downstairs to work is easier. There's not a lot of walking, but the Jews are leaving Chicken Hill. Ten blocks from here is leaving. You know what I mean. Let's go where they are. There are people. Moshe, I like it here. I grew up in this house. The postman knows where I live. Exasperated, Moshe pointed out the kitchen window toward Potsdam. Below, down the hill is America. But Jonah was adamant. America is here. This area is poor, which we are not. It is Negro, which we are not. We are doing well because we serve, you see. That is what we do. The Talmud says it. We must serve. But the Negro is our only customer here. Hasn't their money always spent? That's not the issue. His hands were on the table cradling a cup of tea. She gently placed one of her hands over his. Don't you see what they have, Moshe? Don't you see the well they draw from? What well? What are you talking about? She remained silent for a moment, then said calmly, softly, I remember. Mickey Katz. He had a mandolin player who was missing two fingers. I remember watching him play. He played so wonderfully. Don't you remember? There were so many acts between then and now, he mumbled. What about Chick Webb? She said, he made you a fortune. Webb was expensive. For a cripple, Moshe said. He meant it as a joke, but he felt a hammer of cold silence drop into the room. Is that how you see me? She said softly. She rose from the table and limped off, and did not speak to him for several days. She forgave him only after he presented her with a volume of the Shulchan Aruch, which spelled out the seven requirements of Jewish life, wisdom, meekness, fear of God, love of truth, love of people, possession of a good name, and dislike of money. He apologized, and she became the Chona of old, marching about the house, proclaiming merrily, Charity of mind, without charity of mind, what is life? I was in town and heard a woman say, that poor crippled woman. I thought to myself, who is the cripple, the one who worships a thing, or the one who worships something higher? This kind of talk chafed against his growing belief that more money made for an easier life, but he tolerated it because he knew her heart, and it was a priceless heart indeed. So he remained silent and they stayed in Chicken Hill. On a grey morning in 1936, the twelfth year of their marriage, Chona woke with a cough and pain in her stomach. She avoided doctors, so Moshe waited a day, but then she worsened. Thus began a series of long pilgrimages, going from one doctor to the next, with none having answers. The illness was puzzling. She was fine one day, walking about, laughing, reading her crazy Jewish books, the next day, ill, and bedridden, barely able to move. Back and forth it went. As her condition worsened, Moshe hired Nate's wife, Addie, to help at the grocery store and for Sabbath chores. Chona hated help of any kind, but as her illness worsened, she was forced to give in. Moshe took her to doctors in Philadelphia, Baltimore, even New York City, with no results. Her strange illness, pain in the stomach and sudden fainting spells, continued. Doctors were bewildered. Moshe's old fears and superstitions began to take hold. Could it be that his secret dream of Moses and the Twelves, and his ridiculous belief in the bad luck prediction of the Hasid he had seen but once, had pushed his fortunes to turn. The couple had no children, a fact that Chona bore without complaint, though at times she would stare out the window at the colored children of the neighborhood and fall silent, only to recover and become the Chona of old, laughing and vibrant, chatting about some radio soap opera. She'd heard lately, theirs had been a happy marriage. Twelve wonderful years, just like his dream of Moses and Twelves had strangely preordained. He wanted to tell his wife about his dreams, but as her illness worsened, he didn't want to bother her with such triviality. When Rabbi Feldman came by the house one night to sing and pray as Chona lay restless and swooning. With fever, 
Moshe wanted to confess it to the rabbi, but it didn't seem the proper time. So when the rabbi announced, I feel Chona will improve, Moshe was relieved. But Chona did not improve. She began to black out for no reason and the closest doctor that she would see was in Reading, a good 18 miles away. Chona despised the local doctor, Doc Roberts, and would not allow him to treat her. I grew up with him, she said. If I must see a goy doctor, I will see one, but not him. This made matters more difficult for Doc Roberts, a stout man who still traveled by horse and cart despite the fact that his shiny new Chevrolet sat in the driveway of his ivy-clad home next to the town cemetery, was Potsdown's sole physician. He had a limp similar to Chona's, and yet he marched every year at the head of the local Ku Klux Klan parade. Despite the sheet covering him, everyone knew it was Doc. His girth and limp gave him away. No one complained. It was just one of those things. Once a year, on Klan Parade Day, the Negroes in town disappeared, the Jewish stores closed, the Klan marched, and that was it. But Chona found the whole business distasteful, and to Moshe's horror, she refused to shutter her store. Like the other Jewish merchants, why should I close because of them? She fumed. Even the post office isn't closed. As for Doc Roberts, she told Moshe, he's so fat the back of his neck looks like a pack of hot dogs. She couldn't stand him, but now Moshe needed Doc, and because Chona refused to see him. Every doctor visit meant trooping to Reading to see the kind Jewish doctor. There, yet nothing he did was helping, and Chona's blackouts were getting dangerous. She recovered a bit in the spring, then backtracked into deep illness and walking became nearly impossible. By summer, she was completely bedridden. It was not her bad foot that seemed to be pulling her toward death but rather her stomach, which began to bulge peculiarly, as if mocking her infertility. Moshe frantically sought help from one doctor after another, with increasing urgency, even taking Chona to a nationally known specialist in Boston. But that doctor was as confounded as the rest had been. So Moshe took her home. He put her bed in the front room of the apartment near a window, so she could see the sunrise and read the Talmud as the day broke, for while it was forbidden, it didn't seem to matter now. The room was just above the store, allowing Chona to yell instructions downstairs to Addy, for she insisted on keeping the store open. My work keeps me alive, she said. Chona took two writing letters to the newspaper reminding readers of Jewish holidays and reading joke books to amuse her husband, whose long, exhausted face appeared at her bedside each night after work. She'd offer a slew of jokes and light chatter before falling off to sleep, whereupon he'd dutifully rub her feet and ankles, which had swelled to a disturbing size. He read the Talmud allowed to her even as she slept because he knew she loved it so much. Still, by winter, she worsened. Her fainting spells increased and fever crept in and lingered. It was then, as Chona arced toward death, that the Negroes of Chicken Hill began a steady trek to the Heaven and Earth grocery store. They filed in, day and night, bringing soup, fresh garden vegetables, pies, and country remedies, as well as warm laughter and jokes for the kind, crazy Jewish lady who forced her husband to open his theater to the colored and who extended so much credit to the colored families of Chicken Hill that neither she nor they had any idea of who owed what. The Negroes of Chicken Hill loved Chona. They saw her not as a neighbor but as an artery to freedom. For the recollection of Chona's telltale limp as she and her childhood friend, a tall, gorgeous, silent soul named Bernice Davis walked down the pitted mud roads of the hill to school each morning was stamped in their collective memory. It was proof of the American possibility of equality. We all can get along no matter what. Look at those two. Chona, for her part, saw them not as Negroes but as neighbors with infinitely interesting lives. Darlene, 
whose daughter had the longest case of hiccups Chona had ever seen. Larnell, the twelve-year-old who could not read but could do complex math in his head, and of course Bernice, who had been her next door neighbor and best friend when they were children but who now rarely spoke, and had so many children that the Negroes on the hill laughingly referred to Bernice's brood as forty mules on an acre, because nobody knew exactly how many children Bernice had and they were afraid to ask. The Negroes filled Chona's bedroom with life. They told jokes, recounting tales of spooks and haints, telling humorous stories about fleeing. America's South that made Chona laugh and forget the pain. Addie and her sister Cleota took shifts running the store, keeping kosher on the Sabbath, turning light switches on and off and lighting the stove, keeping the plates and silverware properly separate, both aware at Chona's insistence that no matter what, they should allow Moshe to wake her when he got home from work. Some nights Moshe would arrive to find Addie seated by Chona's bed and Chona asleep, the Talmud on her nightstand, her hand on the open page that she had selected for him to read. He'd nudge her awake and read aloud. She'd compliment his Hebrew, saying how beautiful it sounded, though they both knew it was horrible. Then she'd fall back asleep as he read, whereupon he'd stare at her dark, beautiful face, mesmerized, and weep. Sorrow charged his mind at those moments, electrified his memory, the quaint symbols of holy suppliants in Hebrew signage, which had seemed meaningless to him when he was a child, now gave him impetus. During those cold nights, twelve years after they first fell in love, after weeping a bit, he would charge ahead and continue reading as she slept. He read the word now to keep her alive, and in doing so, a part of him came alive as well. But as the winter turned to spring, Chona began the long fade. One night in late spring, she fell unconscious and was rushed to the hospital in nearby Spring City. She regained consciousness and was released the next day, but not before the doctors told Moshe that if her fever returned, she'd have to come back to the hospital because the end was near. The next day Moshe stayed at her bedside all day, though she didn't seemed to know he was there. She talked feverishly until medicine and fatigue finally took effect, and she spent a good part of the afternoon sleeping. She slept into evening, at which point Addie pushed Moshe out of the house, telling him to get some air. He walked down the hill to his theater to check up on things. He found the ever-loyal Nate and a small crew of Negroes cleaning up after a rousing three-night appearance by the Negro bandleader, Louis Jordan. He grabbed a broom and was about to join them to keep himself from losing his mind when he noticed a figure coming through the backstage door. It was his cousin Isaac from Philadelphia. Let's take a walk, Isaac said. Moshe declined. Instead, he nodded at an empty table and chairs in front of the stage. Isaac, tall and long, wedged himself into a chair. He wore his frock coat and fedora, neither of which he removed. Apparently, he was not planning to stay long. He motioned for Moshe to sit, but Moshe again declined, standing across from his cousin. At thirty-seven, Isaac was an imposing man, nothing like the skinny. Fourteen-year-old who lead his meek young cousin on foot for more than a thousand miles through the foot of the Carpathian Mountains and across Eastern Europe, from Barlad, Romania, to Hamburg, Germany, the two boys dodging police and soldiers, ducking into alleys and hiding behind garbage bins, fuzzgayers, stealing a little here, borrowing a little there, until a kind old woman in Hamburg let them live in her basement where they rolled cigars for her sick husband who did piecework for a local cigar factory, the old man dying upstairs in bits and pieces while the boys worked downstairs for three years to earn boat passage to America. He was a big American now, big in every way, a man of arrogant raw power, with a broad chest and wide shoulders, the owner of nine successful show houses in Philadelphia. He was proudly dressed in a dark suit, crisp white shirt, 
bow, tie, and shiny shoes, a far cry from the days in Romania where they walked about in ragged pants and beaten shoes, shoving stolen bread into their mouths as they fled from angry storekeepers and Russian soldiers. I came to ask you about how to book colored vans, Isaac said. Moshe immediately smelled a rat. Isaac was Philadelphia's biggest theater owner. The smallest of Isaac's nine theaters was bigger than Moshe's two theaters combined. Isaac booked everything from Yiddish shows to vaudeville acts to moving pictures. He could book a traveling circus of trained fleas if he wanted. He needed no help booking Negro bands. Yet Moshe played along, offering a few pointers, with Isaac asking a few surface questions. Then, as Moshe expected, Isaac gently curved the conversation to Chona. He suggested a Jewish home for the sick in Philadelphia. I know people there, he said. They're good people. Your wife can live out the rest of her time there. She'll be in a warm, safe place among friends. Moshe nodded his head, working hard to stifle his outrage. He said, softly, you are rarely wrong about things, cousin. But you are wrong now. Be sensible. She's very ill. I have thought this through, Moshe said. And what have you thought? Moshe felt the blood rush to his face. Are you mocking me? Isaac found himself startled. I am not. You better not. Because if you do, I'll give you such a chamalia. Wallop in the Kashkis guts, you won't forget it. Isaac, survivor of a thousand street fights from Romania to South. Philadelphia, was stunned. The punishing hardships of his childhood had changed him from a fast-moving boy of keen wit into a man of resilience and strength. He was a hard man now. He knew it. His wife knew it. His children knew it. He lived a bleak, empty life. But he also knew that the one bright spot in his clean, rich, loveless American life was that the only person in the world who had experienced every bit of the hatred and evil. That he had never uttered a harsh or angry word toward anyone ever, until that moment. Seeing the rage on Moshe's face shook Isaac badly. He felt as if the earth were shifting beneath his feet. I'm only looking out for your interests, cousin, he mumbled. I know what my interests are, Moshe said. Why is it that you come to me and speak this way? How is the best way to speak of it? Why is it that our people can't speak about illness aloud? Our people don't know about such things, Isaac said. I'm just telling you what I know. Then you don't know enough, Moshe said. She will live. 4. Dodo, our houses from where Chona lay dying, a slender elderly black woman named Addie Timberland stood at the front door of her tiny brown house and peered through its cracks into the cold darkness. Her eyes scanned the muddy road, looking for a lantern, which would mean her husband, Nate, was making his way up the hill. Behind her, at the kitchen table in the front room, the monthly meeting of the Pottstown Association of Negro Men was going full blast, with the usual shouting and nonsense. The association met every third Saturday night around her kitchen table ostensibly to talk about ways for the Negro in Chicken Hill to get more jobs and opportunity, and maybe even one day running water and a sewer line, as opposed to the outhouses, cesspools, and wells that dotted the neighborhood like blisters. It was run by Potsdam's concerned Negro men, leaders, each one, Addy thought Riley, worse than the other. Mostly the men met to play cards, gossip, tell jokes, brag about cars they would never own, and figure out ways to slither around the white man's rules without pissing off the white folks downtown. There were three men at the table, Rusty, a wide-shouldered, brown, complexion 22-year-old in work overalls and a straw hat, Rusty's uncle Bags, and Reverend Ed Spriggs, whom everyone on the hill called Snooks. Next to Snooks sat his wife, Holly, who busied herself knitting. At the moment, the conversation focused around Miss Chona, whom every person in the room knew was dying, and to whom every person in the room, except Addie, 
owed money for groceries, favors, phone, use, extra clothing, and all sorts of life brick a brag. Addie stared out into the night as she heard cards being shuffled. She glanced behind her to see Rusty, a pack of cigarettes peeking out from the front pouch of his overalls, slide the deck over to Snooks and ask, Snooks, do Jews cover the clocks in the house when one of M dies? Snooks, a heavyset man in a rumpled suit and bow tie, pulled the cards closer and winked at bags as he shuffled. Show enough, Rusty, they chew with their teeth, too. Plus, their women wear fur coats in winter, and the men, peace standing up. Bags laughed, but Snooks glanced at his wife, Holly, who frowned. Snooks shot a glance at Addie in the doorway. Addie, make sure you dress Miss Chona in her finest. Don't pleat her hair, nor comb it out in any way. Just leave it free, and put a dish of salt on her chest. It keeps the body from surging up. She ain't gonna pass, Addie said as she stared into the night. Snooks waved a fat hand in the air dismissively and turned back to the table, shuffling cards, then said, if you growed up down home, you'd know about the old ways. Those are good ways. A dish of salt keeps the devil out. Do Jews believe in the devil? Rusty asked. I hope so, Snooks said. Then why'd they murder Jesus Christ? Rusty asked. Snooks, momentarily flummoxed, turned to his wife for an answer, but Holly pretended to be too busy knitting. I didn't say they murdered Jesus Christ, Snooks said. Yes, you did. You said it in church. Many times. Snooks ignored him. There's 66 books in the Bible, Rusty. I can't recollect all of M. Addie, if Miss Jonah passes, put a bit of molasses at her feet and a piece of cornpone on her hair, and put quarters on her eyes. For what? Rusty asked. It keeps their eyes from popping open, Snooks said. Addie, do it. Before her kin shows, they might not cotton to that. Ain't no kin to speak of, Addie said. The father's over in Reading. The mother died years back, before you come up to this country. I don't recollect the mother, Snooks said. You wouldn't want her around no how, Snooks. She was a rough shuffle. For anybody who talked ignorant. She wished Nate would hurry up. She spoke into the crack of the door again, but the bitter words were loud. Enough for the room to hear. If Miss Chona dies, every one of these sorry, half what I might say men. In this town is gonna roll up the pouting lips. They'll cry their eyes out, pretending to be sad. Truth is, they'll be glad to see her go. The words and a cold wind blew into the room together. An embarrassed silence descended. Addie's wore out, Snooks said cheerfully. Holly, stand by the door, and look for Nate. Addie, come set down here and feel some of the lords. Quiet, Addie turned to him. Spell it out, Snooks. Ha, huh. spell out how I'm gonna feel the lords quiet while you busy setting. Here fending and proving, about nothing. Talking about devil in one breath, and putting quarters on Miss Chona's eyes the next. Spell it out, where's the Lord's quiet in all that. Take it easy, Addy, Bags said. He was a stonemason, a stout, large, chested man. Reverend don't mean nothing. He means just what he says, talking about the Lord while holding a deck of cards. Over on Hemlock Row, they run a man out of town for doing that very thing, called his self son of man. They say he was a walking devil. Ain't no such thing as son of man on Hemlock Row, Snooks said. That's just some boogie joogie them country negroes cooked up. They need a real preacher over there. Go on over and preach at M then. The row's three miles from here, Addy, and I got gout in my feet. Why'd you leave off him, Addy, Bags said. God ain't against a man. Playing cards. It's all right, Bags, Snooks said. We is all different. Women got their own understanding about things. There's men's understanding and there's women's understanding and there's wisdom, Addy said. You wasn't singing them songs about the Jew. When your son was sick and Miss Chona made Doc Roberts come see about 
him, and she can't stand him no more than you and I can. Doc Roberts ain't come to Chicken Hill on Miss Chona's account, Snooks said, he come to forget his amnesia. I paid him in advance and he forgot I was colored and thanked me. The men laughed. Addie had had enough. She slipped out into the cold air, closing the door. Behind her, she was a thin, pretty woman with dark eyes that shone brightly, giving her face the innocence of a child, eyes full of surprise, glowing, expectant. They topped a wide nose and the high, gaunt jaws of a Native American. Her family had emigrated from the south to Chicken Hill when she was a tiny child. Unlike most blacks on the hill, she had no memories of back home, the world of the south, chinaberry and pecan trees or jewberries or hearing laughter from the field truck that drove the negroes out to pick cotton. Sometimes she wished she could remember the south just to have something pleasant to dream about, like the others in Chicken Hill who referred to North Carolina or Alabama or Georgia as home. Home for Addie was Chicken Hill, Potsdown, Pa. She took a few tentative steps, peering down the dark road, her eyes scanning the darkness, looking for the familiar Irish schoolboy cap and short sleeve white cotton shirt Nate favored even on the coldest days. The wind bit into her skin, but she stayed where she was, her eyes searching the road, nothing, just as she was about to head inside, a tall, thin shadow crossed under the lone streetlight that illuminated the far corner. She saw it was him, the long strides stopping as he carefully stepped over the narrow ditches that carried sewage and rainwater. As he approached, she walked up to him and placed a warm hand on his face. Why'd you bring your lantern? She asked. Nate ignored that. He didn't need a lantern. He'd been walking the same route from the theater for years. He stood for a moment as she held her hand to his face, and only after he brought his long hand up to touch hers. Did she move toward the house, Nate behind her? The laughing and chatting ceased when Nate walked in. He looked about the room, then nodded toward the door of Chona's heaven and earth grocery store and addressed Addie. Is she passed? No. How's Mr. Moshe? Nate shook his head. His cousin come all the way up from Philadelphia, talking about putting her in a home of some kind. What for? She got her right mind. Nate sighed. He pulled a chair out from the table and sat, draping his long frame across it. Don't matter what they decide. The Lord's got his own plan for her. That's right, Snooks said quickly. A plume of embarrassment drifted into the room. On paper, Snooks was the community leader of Chicken Hill. When the city fathers wanted to make a donation or announce plans to do anything on the hill, they approached Snooks, whom they referred to as Reverend Spriggs. But on the hill, it was Nate Timberland's opinion that counted. Nate smiled at Snooks. You still reading out the book of Revelation? Snooks. Snooks nodded. I am. Tell me one then. Snooks shifted uncomfortably. Like most colored on the hill, Snooks was a little afraid of Nate. There was a silent pull in Nate Timberland, a stirring that did not invite foolishness, a quiet that covered a kind of tempest. Like most on the hill, Nate claimed the South as his home, but unlike his fellow hill residents, he never spoke of his past. That was a dark hole. He was a light turned off, but to the colored of the hill, a light switched off did not mean it could not be switched back on. Anything could happen in this world, especially on the hill, where the occasional piece of chickens and goats squawking and bleating happily could disintegrate into a wild scramble of booze, bullets, spilled guts, and chaos. Nate was easygoing, quiet, deft, slow-moving, with a wide smile and hands that gripped hammers tightly and eyes that gazed at you dead on, but he was, even at sixty, what the old folks called much of a man. Even Fatty Davis, the muscled, gregarious, gold-toothed force who ran the hills only, speakeasy and who fist fought the cops and wrestled with the Irish firefighters at Empire Fire Company in town, 
made it a point to steer clear of crossing Nate. I'd rather die in a storm, he said. Snooks, seated at the kitchen table, was angry at himself for noodling with Addie, for she was, everyone knew, a serious woman and also Nate's wife. He managed to spurt out, we shall not all sleep, but we'll be changed at the last trumpet in a moment. Quote, Nate nodded. He removed his cap and tossed it on the table. Addie, standing at the stove behind Holly, decided to drop the bomb quickly. Dodo's missing, she said. Nate's dark eyes locked on Addie's face. He's what? Gone missing. When? Today. They say he's gone 50 miles. All the way to Philadelphia. How you know he's gone that far? That's what they say. Who's they? Eula's boys. CJ and Callie. They was out fishing in the Manitourney Creek this morning, behind that new tire factory. They seen him riding on the freight shuttle to Berwyn, hanging on the ladder. The road from that yard there runs straight to Philly, about 10 or 12 miles. He can walk it, or ride another freight train. He's tried that before. The three men at the table stared in alarm at Addy. Why didn't you say something? Rusty said. Which one of Yal got a car? She asked. None did. Nate was incredulous. The boy's deaf as a pole. Them boys didn't think. Enough to snatch him. They jumped up to get him. But a white man from the tire factory came. Out and run them off. They had to circle all the way round the other side. Of the Manitourney and cut through the hill school to get here. It was dark. By then. Ain't none of. M had a nickel to call. What phone they gonna use? Addie asked. Miss Jonas got the only pay phone here on the hill that the colored's free to use. Them children ain't going into no white folks place asking about nobody's phone. Nate pursed his lips as frustration and irritation moved across his smooth face. He stood up and reached for his hat. Who's up that got a car at this hour? Fatty. Lloyd's busy selling sip sauce at this time of night, Nate said. The room noted that Nate called Fatty, owner of the local juke joint, by his real name. He turned for the door. Where you going? Addy said. Fabicelli's bakery. Mr. Fabi got a truck. He's gone, Addy said. Since when? Two weeks ago. He sold his store. To who? Jewish fella. Nate searched his memory. I know every Jew in this town. Ain't heard of nobody buying no new business. New man, Mr. Malachi. Rusty helped him put up a sign just yesterday. Addy said. Nate's hard stare turned to Rusty. What's he like, Rusty? He's all right, Rusty said carefully. All right then. I seen Mr. Fabby's truck parked outside the bakery on the way up here. I reckon the new man must bought it. I'll go with you, Snooks said. No, you won't, Nate said. One colored knocking at night is enough. To Addy, he asked, where's my long coat? I washed it yesterday. It's drying in the shed out back. I don't know that. It's dry yet. But Nate had already grabbed a gas lamp from the stove, stepped out the back door, and was gone. Nate moved silently down the dark garden rouse behind his house. There was no moon, and the lamp shone eerily on the rows of okra and collard. Greens. He moved past them with the swift ease of familiarity. He'd dug that garden with his own hands. He and his wife had planted every vegetable there. A tiny creek flowed at the far end of the yard behind the shed, which was also used as a curing house for tobacco and ham. He unlatched the shed door, stepped inside, pulled his long coat off a meat hook hanging from the ceiling, closed the door, and thrust one hand up the sleeve of his coat. As he did, he heard a splash in the creek just a few yards behind him. He froze, suspecting it might be a beaver. He listened but heard nothing else, so he stepped away from the door, then heard another splash. He extinguished the lamp, slipped his coat all the way on, and moved around the side of the shed toward the creek. He peered into the darkness, seeing nothing at first. The water was illuminated from the light seeping out of the houses on the top side of the hill, the reflections creating short shadows in the trees on his side of the bank. 
From where he stood, he could see the bank for a few yards. But, nothing farther, then twenty-five yards out, less than twenty steps away, he saw the boy. Nate Timberland was a man who, on paper, had very little. Like most Negroes in America, he lived in a nation with statutes and decrees that consigned him as an equal but not equal, his life bound by a set of rules and regulations in matters of equality that largely did not apply to him. His world, his wants, his needs were of little value to anyone but himself. He had no children, no car, no insurance policy, no bank account, no dining room set, no jewelry, no business, no set of keys to anything he owned, and no land. He was a man without a country living in a world of ghosts, for having no country meant no involvement and not caring for a thing beyond your own heart and head, and ghosts and spirits were the only thing certain. In a world where your existence was invisible, the truth was, the only country Nate knew or cared about, besides Addie, was the thin, deaf twelve-year-old boy who at the moment either was riding a freight train to Philadelphia or was a full-blown ghost wearing a schoolboy cap, old boots, and a ragged shirt and vest, standing ten feet from him and tossing small boulders into the Manitoni Creek before his eyes. Which one was it? Dodo. It was surprise that caused him to utter the boy's name, for he knew he might as well have been talking to himself. The boy couldn't hear. Even so, the child was busy, moving with the swiftness of an athlete, sorting through stones at the riverbank, stacking large ones to make some kind of embankment along the creek's edge, tossing smaller rocks into the water. Nate knelt, relit the lamp, and held it high, waving it to get the deaf boy's attention. With Dodo, everything was sight, feel, and vibration, not sound. The light cast an eerie glow on the water, yet the boy was so involved in what he was doing that Nate had to wave the light several times. The boy saw the lamp's reflection in the water first, then dropped the rock he was holding, turned to the source of the light, and stood up straight. A thin arm raised in a shy hello as Nate approached. Nate pointed at the rock formation. What you doing, boy? Dodo smiled. He motioned Nate closer. He drew a wide circle with his arms, demonstrating a circle of rocks, then Nate holding a cradle like he was rocking a baby. Say what now? The boy rubbed his hands together, as if creating magic or heat, then cupped his hands to his ear, as if he could hear sound. Nate shook his head, not understanding. He stepped inside the embankment of rocks, which formed a wall about two feet high. They were shaped like a kind of five by five box. What kind of foolishness you working on here? Dodo looked at him blankly, then rubbed his hands on his pants, drying them. You got a hole in your head, son. Was you riding the train this morning? Was that you? Dodo blinked, standing patiently, still rubbing his hands on his pants. Nate gently touched one of the boy's hands. They were freezing. He placed the lamp high, holding it so that his lips could be seen. The boy had not been born deaf. An accident killed his hearing. A stove blew up in his mother's kitchen when he was nine. Killed his eyes and ears. His eyes came back. His ears did not, but he could read lips. Nate held the lamp next to his face so Dodo could see them. What you doing? The boy's eyes danced away, then he said, making a garden. For what? To grow sunflowers. CJ and them said you was on a train this morning. Dodo looked away. It was his way of ignoring conversation. Nate calmly reached out and slowly turned the boy's head so that the boy faced him. Was you on that train or not? Dodo nodded. All right then. Nate looked about, then pointed to a dogwood tree. Nearby, tear me off a branch from that tree yonder and make a switch. Then come on in the house. Your auntie'll even you out. Nate turned to move back toward the house. He took several steps, then noticed that he was alone. Dodo remained where he was, amid his rock embankment. 
Nate waved him on, irritated. Come on, son, it's cold out here, you're, won't you warm your little toasters and it'll be over. Dodo's breath quickened, but he stood where he was. Nate took several quick steps to close the distance between them, knelt, and placed a big hand on the boy's shoulder. Taking a lickin' is to your benefit, son. The truth never hurt nobody. That was you on that train. Right, yes. You picked a poor time to go jollying. You know that, don't ya? Dodo nodded. Well then, when you hauls trouble to circumstance, you got to pay. Your auntie'll heat up your little cookers for a minute. The lesson behind it will last, and that'll do it, I reckon. He reached for the boy's hand, but instead of reaching out, the boy drew. From his pocket a folded and wrinkled white piece of paper. Nate gently removed it from the boy's hand and, unfolding it, held it up. To the lantern, he read the words slowly, running his eyes closely across the paper. When he was done, he lowered the paper and his gaze settled on the boy. I can't read fancy words, Dodo, but Reverend Spriggs inside reads. Good, we'll ask him to figure them out. Dodo spoke. I know what it says, he said. What's that? My ma's dead. Nate was silent a moment. He peered up the slight embankment, toward the shed and the house, thinking to himself of all that was wrong in the world. So many of God's dangers, he thought, are not the gifts they appear to be. You don't need no paper to tell you your ma's got wings, son. Then why I got to leave? Who says you leaving? This paper says it. Nate gently took the paper from the boy, crumpled it, and tossed it in the creek. The tall man leaned down and tapped the boy's chest gently. God, opened up your heart when he closed your ears, boy. You got a whole country in there. Don't fret about no paper. That paper don't mean nothing. He took the boy's hand and led him up the slight embankment around the shed and toward the house. Chapter 5 The Stranger Woe days later, Moshe was fast asleep in a chair next to Chona's bed. When knocking at the door downstairs awakened him, he watched through heavy eyelids as Addy, sleeping in a chair on the other side of the bed, woke up, staggered sleepily to the doorway, and clomped down the stairs to the darkened grocery store below. Moshe looked at his watch. It was 4.30 a.m. He gazed at his wife. She lay with her eyes closed. He leaned forward and checked her pulse, then placed his hand on her chest. She was, he noted with relief, breathing, still very much alive. Addy marched back upstairs and stood in the doorway, looking irritated. There's a man down there wanting to see you. Tell him to go away. He won't. Who is it? He's the fellow who bored Mr. Fabicelli's bakery. He's a baker. I don't know what he is. What's he want? He said something about, she paused, giving away hollers. What? Something about helping Miss Chona and hollers. Hollers. I reckon it's Jewish words, Mr. Moshe. How do you know it's Jewish words? Addy frowned. I don't know what it is. I'm guessing. Why'd you ask him yourself? He came by yesterday and the day before that. He came here three times already. Send him away. Addy stood in the doorway, wavering, then with decided movement. Stepped into the room, pulled her chair close to Chona's head, and sat. Hunched over, her forearms resting on her knees, and stared at the floor. She glanced at the sleeping Chona through misty eyes, coughed, then wiped her. Tearing eyes with the back of her hand. I ain't going back down there. Moshe hesitated, confused. Between Addy and Chona, he felt like a ping-pong ball. The two women had taken turns babying him over the years. He never had to cook, nor clean, nor do any of the chores that he'd had to do as a child back in the old country. But they conspired against him. Chona gave Addy a voice, let her run the store, make decisions, run the place while she read her socialism books and crazy women nonsense. Now, look at this mess. His own help in his own house was telling him to answer. His own door in the middle of the night. If Chona left this world, he'd be 
stuck with Addy nagging him to death. He wanted to stand up and yell, but instead found himself staring at his wife. He leaned over, gently rubbing his wife's forehead. Suppose she wakes while I'm downstairs, or doesn't wake at all. Addy, seated on the other side of the bed, had gathered herself. She reached over and fluffed the edges of Chona's pillow, then wiped her face gently with a soft cloth. She wakes every day, Mr. Moshe, she said. She wakes like a clock. She's all right. Moshe took one last worried glance at his sleeping wife, then made for the door. At the bottom of the stairs, he turned on the light, walked past the rows of home goods, boxes, and jars of candies in the darkened store. Dawn was coming. As he approached the glass-paned outer door, he could see the sunlight peering over the edge of a small figure whose silhouette was framed in the doorway. He opened the door a crack and found himself peering at a small, stout Jewish man in his thirties with sparkling eyes, a thin moustache, and wide corners at his mouth, giving him an impish look. The man looked vaguely familiar. He was also smiling, which made Moshe hate him immediately. Good morning, he said in Yiddish. What do you want? Moshe replied in English. He was in no mood for favors. Don't you remember me? The man asked. He spoke again in Yiddish, which irritated Moshe even more. It meant he definitely wanted something. Moshe snapped off a quick response. Ver Farblonjet. Trog zitch op. Get lost, and push the door to close it. But the man jammed a mangled old boot in the doorway, which was struck by the closing door. Ow, he cried, could you let my foot out? Will you put your foot in the road if I do? I will. Moshe pulled the door slightly ajar to release the foot, but instead of pulling his foot out, the stranger placed his forearm on the door and tried to push it open farther. Moshe, surprised, held it firm, leaning against it. What are you doing? I just need flour, he said. We're closed. I need kosher. For hala bread. Moshe frowned and sucked his teeth. Hala, not hola. That's what Addy heard. He pushed against the door to close it, but the man on the other side of the glass panel door held firm. Is that what you told my maid? Moshe asked. The man chuckled. Another American Jew with a maid. She's rude, he said. Go to Reading. They got plenty kosher there. And rude maids, too, if you want one, Moshe said. He pushed against the door, but the man held firm. That's twelve miles away. What am I? A taxi. Get a horse and buggy then. Moshe pushed against the door harder. To his surprise, the man, whom he could see through the door, was much smaller than he was and yet still firmly held his side quite easily. I have to eat better and sleep more, Moshe thought. He pushed harder, and to his disbelief, the door remained cracked. The man held it partway, open without straining. What's wrong with you? Moshe snapped. Frustrated, he threw his shoulder into the door. The little man did the same, and the door remained. Cracked a precious few inches, wide enough for Moshe to see the outline of his adversary's face, which much to his consternation, was not straining at all. What kind of devil are you? He cried. I just need flour to make hala. Get it someplace else. Moshe pushed with all his might now. Sweat broke out on his forehead. His teeth clenched tightly, the side of his face pressed against the edge of the door. He glanced at his adversary through the glass panel. His face was just inches away. The small man, still not working hard, held his side. He appeared to be amused. Was he some kind of demon? The angel of death, Moshe thought. Come for my wife. He suddenly felt helpless. He wished Nate were here. Nate was strong enough to slam the door with one arm and push this monkey to the street. Or his cousin Isaac. One glare from Isaac would send this mule fleeing. But he was alone. He almost called out for Addy, then decided against it, he was too embarrassed. Instead, 
He pushed now with everything he had, every muscle straining. Still, the stranger, who seemed to have the might of three men, held firm. Moshe felt his strength ebbing. He was exhausted. Between running the theater and all-night vigils at Chona's side and not eating, he hadn't much energy anyway. He felt his spirit leaving his body through his feet. Ridiculous, he thought. Please go, he gasped. I want to tell you something, the man said. You're a devil, Moshe grunted in Yiddish through gritted teeth, then said to himself, why am I speaking Yiddish? I hate Yiddish. From the other side of the door, the little man said evenly, do not call me a devil. I am a dancer. Dance down the road then, or I'll yell for the police. You're breaking into my property. I'm not breaking in. Get away. My wife is sick. That's why I'm here, the stranger said. With one great shove, he pushed the door wide, sending Moshe tumbling backward. Moshe landed on his rear end on the cold wooden floor next to the glass counter butcher. Case with a heavy thunk that shook the bottles and goods on the shelves. From the floor, he heard Addy yell from upstairs. What's going on? Down there. Yal be quiet. Moshe looked up, expecting the stranger to stomp into the store, lean over, and clobber him. Instead, the little man stood in the doorway several feet off, peering down, his hands on his hips, his stout body filling the doorway. A tallet hung out from his waistband. His fedora was worn and his suit was ratty, as if mice had chewed on the edges. His shirt was white, and a clipped string tie hung down to his waist. He puffed his cheeks and looked about the darkened store. Don't worry about your free-thinking Jewish wife, friend. She won't swallow her birth certificate anytime soon. Her type of Jew does. Well in this country, I've seen it. May onions grow in your navel, to talk about my wife that way. That's a Spanish saying, friend. Do you speak Spanish? No. Do you? As a matter of fact, I do. I've even been to Spain. Then do me a favor, you nut. Go back there, not till I get my flower. Moshe instinctively fell back to one of the many wily tricks he'd learned. As a child in Romania, when the leaders of the traveling Jewish theater, troop of which he was a part would stand at the edge of town, facing hordes of Russian peasants armed with rifles and clubs demanding last minute payment for some infringement, usually imaginary, on the part of the troop, for it was always easier to refuse to pay for entertainment. Already provided, especially since the lovely Jewish maidens whose dancing inspired the peasantry to enjoy the troop in the first place weren't putting out. Moreover, since then, Moshe had picked up a few tricks of his own in twelve years of negotiating with hard-boiled band managers at his theater. Seated on his duff, with one hand leaning on a glass cabinet holding candies, sewing needles, and other store supplies, he looked up and said, Gently, I will leave it to you, friend, to decide what is best for you to do. For while you are a stranger to me, it is my duty to welcome you, for I am no stranger to hardship, having come from a land where a horse's hoof is more valuable than a piece of bread. A horse's hoof, you see, can help plough a field and feed an entire village. But bread, what does bread do? You eat it, and then you must bake another. Myself, I have neither. I am but a poor merchant who sells candy and dry goods. Come in, take all the flour you want, and I will leave it to you to decide what to pay. The stranger chuckled and said in Yiddish, Be careful, you Romanian. Rascal, are you Hungarian, Polish, they've got Schmeichlers, fast talkers, in Poland, too. Look who's talking, the only thing you'd earn in Poland with your fast talk is an empty feeling. He glanced around the store. Poor you are not, friend, the important thing is, I have good news. I come to tell you I found a wife, you found a what, a wife, Moshe, seated on the floor, stared up at him, stunned. Why should I care that you found a wife? I have my own wife to worry about. For the first time, 
the man in the doorway, his face brimming with confidence, seemed to wither. He looked genuinely hurt. But you said Ishold get one. What am I? Mashed potatoes. What do I care if you have a wife? My own wife is sick at this very moment. Pox on you that you should bother me. At this time, yellow and green, you should become. Take all the flour you want and go flap your tongue someplace else, you dumb pole. Get away from me. But I did what you said. Peddle your fish elsewhere, sir. You said without a wife, why should I come to a dance? But you did not make me leave. You let me stay, and I danced. That's why I'm here now. You invited me. I did no such thing. You said it. You said wherever I live is home of the greatest dancer in the world. What are you talking about? Get out of my house. You don't remember the dance. What dance? The man drew his head back in disbelief. He spread his hands in disappointment. What dance? He said merrily. What dance? The only dance. The greatest dance. The greatest dance of family fun and frolic that this country has ever seen. The greatest dance ever. Moshe, from his place on the floor, stared at the figure as slices of his memory fluttered back like pages in a book. In the dawn's early light, as the sun glimmered its first peak over the eastern slopes and shone down on the shacks and shanties of Chicken Hill, inside the very building where, in the warm basement twelve years before, love flew into his heart with the grace of a butterfly, and a beautiful young girl, now his wife, churned yellow into butter, pointing out the magic words of the Torah to him, a book she was forbidden to touch, her hand running across the page, revealing the promise. Held by words of sanctity, love, and history, the shutters of memory flickered again and he saw amid the crowd outside his theater the impish face, the hat, the talent, the dimples of a young man standing among Jews of all types, then, as if a distant bell were ringing, like a train whistle in the distance, he heard, in distant memory, the wonderful wailing clarinet of Mickey Katz, and he remembered in full that wonderful cold December afternoon, when freshly married and in the full flush of love, he turned the corner of High Street and looked up to see more Jews in one place in America than he had ever seen in his life, the hordes rising into focus like the great temples of Egypt rising in the sunlight of the Arab dawn, hundreds and hundreds of Jews, assembled in front of his theater, eager to flood the door, to make him rich, to clamber inside so they could howl, yelp, dance, and have a joyful moment like the times of old, and among them a young Hasid who announced that he would not dance with any woman, because he was looking for a wife, staring at the man, Moshe felt the same lightness he felt when he first turned the corner of High Street and saw all those people. It was as if a great weight had been lifted off his chest and placed on his back where it belonged, seated and solid. Twelve years fell away and he was a young man, again, standing in the wings of his theater watching Mickey Katz's merry band peeling off the wallpaper with sound as hundreds of happy American Jews danced and among them was the gyrating, twisting body of the crazy Hasidic dancer, the young man who announced he did not want to dance with any woman, the young man who proclaimed he was not looking for a dancer but rather a wife, yet who danced with every woman on the floor. And what a dancer he was. I remember you, Moshe said excitedly. You were the greatest dancer I ever saw. What's your name? Instead of answering, the young Hasid proudly removed his hat, scratched at his forehead, and gazed down his nose at Moshe, still on the floor next to the butcher's case. He spoke slowly, as if he were a wise old man. Our rabbinical sages tell us we have three names, one given by our friends, one given by our family, and one we give ourselves. So I should call you peas, tomatoes, or onions. Malachi, he said, he started to say something else, but Moshe, in full flush of memory, was bursting with excitement, 
for a question had gnawed at him for years. And he couldn't believe his luck. I saw you the next day, he said, after, cats left, outside the theater, you gave me a bottle of plum brandy. We, heard something pop on the hill. We saw black smoke. You said it was a, bad sign, that was a bad time, Malachi said, stepping into the store and reaching out a hand to help Moshe to his feet. Those times have ended. Chapter 6 Harla, Hona's fever broke two days later. Her feverish rants ceased a day. After that, the following day she sat up, then peacefulness seemed to descend on her small frame, and wellness began a long, slow return. But, alas, she could not stand for long periods or walk unassisted. A visit from a special doctor from Philadelphia that Moshe's cousin Isaac had arranged, confirmed that some kind of blood problem had produced a brain attack. That, given her bad foot, may make walking unassisted difficult. Moshe didn't care, even if she needed a wheelchair for the rest of her life, as long as she could be the Chona of old, he was happy. After a week, he saw the light return to her eyes. A week later, she began to talk in long sentences, albeit slowly. By the third week, she was standing with the support of Addy and giving orders, demanding to go downstairs and open the store. Moshe happily complied. He attributed her improvement to the arrival of Malachi, who insisted on dropping by the theater every day to deliver a loaf of his hala for Moshe to carry home to his wife. This will be part of your wife's healing, he said proudly. He delivered his very first hala to Moshe at the theater, still wearing his ragged costume of sport coat, hat, tallet, and homburg. He held the loaf, proudly, like he was carrying a child. You will be my first customer, he said. Moshe took the loaf with the same dainty care it was offered. Although he never liked hala, he was charmed. He preferred regular white slicey bread and American sandwiches of ham and cheese, which were like everything in America, neat and quick, not fluffy and thick and soupy like old European food. But Malachi's bread was new and something about him lifted Moshe's heart, so Moshe readily tore off a piece, shoved it in his mouth, and nearly gagged. He managed to gurgle a thank you but only two keep from vomiting onto the floor the turgid mess of what tasted like onions, sand, and grease. Wonderful, he said. It will bring healing wherever it goes, Malachi said proudly. It will be like your wonderful theater. It will bring people together. To a hospital maybe, Moshe thought, nodding. But he smiled and said, nothing. He hated to offend his new friend. He promised to bring the bread home to his wife that very evening, but instead he offered it to Nate as they walked home together after the theater closed, the two climbing the tight dirt roads of Chicken Hill in the wee hours. He did it with a disclaimer, saying, the new baker is just learning. Nate took a chore out of the bread, uttered no comment, and tossed the whole mess to a brown spotted mutt who emerged from one of the claptrap houses that lined the roads up onto the hill. The dog was a nuisance who regularly terrorized them on their night walks home, and when Moshe walked home alone, he took a roundabout route to avoid the creature. Altogether, the mutt swallowed the hala in one gulp, and thus, when Malachi asked Moshe the next day if his hala was bringing healing to his home, Moshe was happy to inform him, yes indeed, and peace as well, for the mongrel to his surprise, left him alone for the first time ever. Indeed, as horrible as the Hala was, it was proof of the magic that seemed to accompany everything Malachi touched, for the dog never bothered Moshe again. Calamity and disorganization seemed to follow Moshe's new friend everywhere, yet it never touched or stirred him. Malachi was not a neat man. His suit was forever rumpled, his hat furrowed, his talent frayed, his clear blue eyes always somewhat distant. His head was constantly bowed, his attention deep in the pages of his prayer book, 
sometimes for hours, even when he baked, allowing his pies and bread to burn. It was clear to Moshe that his new friend was not a born baker. He noted that Malachi's apartment above the bakery was full of junk. Items he had gathered, sold, bought, and somehow assembled from here and there, for Malachi confessed he'd been a traveling salesman of one kind or another since his arrival in the new land from the old country. His travels had clearly broadened him, as he was an endless fount of knowledge about everything from automobiles to the iron-making factories of Potsdam. For all his horrible baking and utter disorganization, Malachi had a lightness and boundless enthusiasm about worldly matters. He seemed to bring light and air and goodness to everything he touched. He marveled at the simplest items, an apple peeler, a barrel, a menorah, a paper cup, a marble, with enthusiasm and humor, often holding the item up and saying, marvelous. Imagine, who thought of this? Moshe had few friends. Most of Potsdam's Jews had left Chicken Hill by then. Nate was a friend, but he was a Negro, so there was that space between them. But with Malachi, there was no space. They were fellow escapees who, having endured the landing at Ellis Island and escaped the grinding sweatshops and vicious crime of the vermin-infested Lower East side, had arrived by hook or crook in the land of opportunity that was Pennsylvania, home to Quakers, Mormons, and Presbyterians. Who cared that life was lonely, that jobs were thankless drudgery, that the romance of the proud American state was myth, that the rules of life were laid carefully in neat books and laws written by stern Europeans who stalked the town and state like the Grim Reaper, with their righteous churches spouting that Jews murdered the precious Jesus Christ. Their fellow Pennsylvanians knew nothing about the shattered shtetls and destroyed synagogues of the old country. They had not set eyes on the stunned elderly immigrants. Starving in tenements in New York, the old ones who came alone, who spoke Yiddish only, whose children died or left them to live in charity. Homes, the women frightened until the end, the men consigned to a life of selling vegetables and fruits on horse-drawn carts. They were a lost nation, spread across the American countryside, bewildered, the yeshiva, education useless, their proud history ignored, as the clankety clank of American industry churned around them, their proud past as watchmakers and tailors, scholars and historians, musicians and artists, gone, wasted. Americans cared about money, and power, and government. Jews had none of those things. The job was to tread lightly in the land of milk and honey and be thankful that they were free to walk the land without getting the duffs kicked, or worse. Life in America was hard, but it was free, and if you worked hard, you might gain some opportunity, maybe even open a shop or business of some kind. Moshe, the proud owner of two thriving theaters and a grocery store that lost money every year thanks to his American-born Jewish wife, felt proud to be American. He cherished American life. He tried hard to convince his new friend of the goodness of America's ways. He gave his new friend a mezuzah pendant, a mezuzah normally adorns the doorway of a Jewish home, but this pendant could be worn around the neck, and it bore a special inscription on the back that read, Home of the Greatest Dancer in the World. That way, Moshe explained, Malachi would feel at home and welcome everywhere he went. But Malachi, normally amused by kind gestures and small gifts, returned. The mezuzah and politely begged Moshe to give it to Chona, which he did. To her delight, unlike most Jews, Malachi was proud of what he laughingly called his clankety clank life in Europe that he'd left behind. He didn't mind being a greenhorn. He refused to dress like an American, preferring to wear his talent under his shirt, the ends of which hung down his pants. He was kosher to the point of what Moshe considered to be useless. A fat-worn prayer book, a mascot, 
bulged out of the back pocket of his oversized pants like a big city cop's ticket book. It went with him everywhere. He was constantly snatching it out of his pocket, stopping whatever he was doing, flipping it open expertly to a well-read passage, sometimes so moved by what he read that he'd place the book to his chest and bow his head, humming a fervent prayer in Hebrew. One afternoon, as the two enjoyed tea, Malachi placed his prayer book on the table. Moshe tapped it and said, Carefully, I'm shy about Jewish things in this country. Why, it's not too good to waste time with old things. Malachi smiled. The prayers in that Siddur volume, Malachi said, are not old. He picked up the old Magza. These are actually for high holidays like Pesach and Sukkot. They're not for everyday matters. But I use it for everyday matters anyway. Isn't that wrong? Moshe asked. Malachi chuckled. The prophet Isaiah condemns routine, mechanical prayers anyway. So it doesn't matter. Are you a Rebbe? Moshe asked. Depends on who's asking. Doesn't a Rebbe have to be educated at Yeshiva? Why are you worried if I'm a Rebbe or not? So long as your words are uttered thoughtfully and with full intent, it doesn't matter. Our ways give comfort rather than cause sorrow. They bring joy rather than pain. I told you, your wife would get well. And she did. What does it matter if a Rebbe delivers those words or me? I'm not a Rebbe, by the way. I just follow the Talmud, though my bread did make your wife well. Moshe laughed. My cousin Isaac said his doctor made her well. Malachi smiled sternly. Friend, the truth is neither made her well, not my bread, nor your cousin's fancy doctor. The fullness of the earth made her well. Psalm 24 says mankind must enjoy the fullness of the earth. Is bread not part of the earth's fullness? Moshe shrugged and let the matter rest. He was so happy that Shona was improving that he was afraid to jinx matters. Why not come to the house to eat? He said, you haven't actually met my wife. In time, Malachi said, it was just the kind of response that kept Moshe on edge and curious about his new friend, the series of odd behaviors that seemed to be part and parcel of him. He guessed that perhaps Malachi did not want to meet Chona because he was prohibited, at least in his mind, from touching her. But still, he visited the theater with bread nearly every afternoon after closing his shop and was always bright and cheerful, full of questions about the theater, Moshe's crew, his business, life in America. And while he always asked about Jonah's continuing improvement, Malachi declined to talk of his own wife, of whom he'd bragged so freely when he first arrived. Moshe never asked. He understood that marriage for new Jews in America was complex. Some men had wives back in Europe and took new wives. Here, others missed their wives so terribly that to mention them brought tears, ranting, and even cursing and fighting. Some worked for years to save enough to send for their wives, only to discover after the wife arrived that both had changed so much the marriage was no longer tenable. Moshe, aware of those matters and happy that his own marriage was intact, stayed quiet on the matter. Still, Malachi's reticence about his past and his wife was a strange divide between them, and it only made Moshe more curious. He wanted to cross it and would have but for Malachi's floundering bakery, which took precedence, for its failure began almost immediately. Even if Malachi had been the best baker in the world, he'd arrived in pots down at a bad time. Fabicelli, the kind old Italian baker who set his weak old pastries out every Sunday evening on a wooden crate for whoever in the hill wanted them, and from whom Malachi had purchased the bakery, was one of the last white merchants remaining in Chicken Hill. Only Herb, Radomitz's ice house, which delivered ice by horse and cart, and the irascible Lithuanian shoe store owners, Irvin Marvin Skrupskelis, who scared the Bajesis out of everybody, were left. The other white stores had descended to the greener pastures of High Street, just ten blocks away. And while the kind, 
Old Fabicelli was happy to sell his old delivery truck, bakery, and building that contained the upstairs apartment to the itinerant Jew. He obviously did not sell his recipes for the rest of Malachi's. Baked goods were as bad, if not worse, than his hala. His cakes were catastrophes. They looked like finger paintings done by a six-year-old with dripping icing and ragged edges. His buns tasted like chopped liver. The interior of his meat pies looked like moldy corned beef in need of a painter. With a brush and a can of red paint, even Chicken Hill's Negroes, long used to rotting food and old goods, avoided Malachi's shop. It was a testament to the 17 Jewish families in Potsdam that the bakery survived the first few weeks at all. Moshe watched this deterioration with concern, and one afternoon, when Malachi came by the theater to drop off his usual gift of flour and water. Disguised as Hala, Moshe decided to bring up the matter of Malachi's baking. The two were standing near the front of the theater as they talked, while Nate and a small crew were preparing the stage for an appearance that night by the mighty Count Basie Orchestra. Before Moshe could even broach the subject, Malachi, in the mood to talk about his business, tossed a loaf of hala wrapped in brown paper on the edge of the stage and confessed, I closed the bakery early. Why? Business is slow. People don't like my bread. What's wrong with my bread? It's good bread. He leaned on the edge of the stage, glancing at Nate and the three other Negroes in the back who were wiping tables and sweeping up trash from the previous night's event. Moshe asked carefully, have you owned a bakery before? Of course not. Why buy a bakery then? It was for sale. There are many other businesses. What's wrong with buying a bakery? Nothing. But you need to be apprenticed in these matters. Why? I am a good cook. Baking is not cooking. Baking, from what I understand, requires precision. Did you bake in the old country? Malachi did not answer directly. Instead, he removed his hat, ran his fingers through his thick, curly hair, placed his hat back on his head, then fished through his coat jacket pockets, pulling out all manner of baking tools shaker, sifter, pastry mat, scraper, dough scoop, spatula, and rolling pin. He carefully placed them on the stage edge, lining them up neatly. These are my tools. I practice all the time. I'm teaching myself. You cannot teach and sell at the same time, friend. Why not? Isn't this how they do it in America? Maybe, but before you buy a business, not after. Malachi's normally bright eyes darkened a bit. I'm confused. When I first came to America, I went to Pittsburgh. But nobody wanted to hire me. Because I went to Yeshiva. They thought I was too intellectual. I went to a big department store. I said, I can be an interpreter because I speak many languages. I speak Yiddish, German, Polish, Russian, and Spanish. I can talk to customers in their language and suggest things. Instead, they put me to work tagging dresses. So I worked on a vegetable cart. But the man who owned it wanted me to work on the Sabbath, so I left. Then I worked in a diner cleaning pickle barrels. My fingers were swollen from pickle juice. Then I sold white supplies off a horse and wagon. I eventually bought the horse and wagon from the man who owned them. From there, I saved enough to buy a bakery. It took nine years. Was your wife there during that time? Moshe asked. Malachi's eyes misted and he ignored the question, pointing to the bakery tools on the stage. I practice all the time. Even at night, I make the prettiest cakes. Have you ever tried my pies? Given his experience with Malachi's hala, Moshe had no intention of doing that. Instead, he gently pointed to Nate at the back of the theater, cleaning and setting up with his small crew. My Nate can help you find some colored workers. Malachi shook his head. Does he keep kosher? He asked. A kosher bakery doesn't need a kosher baker, Moshe said. Malachi was silent a moment, then said, it's not wise to mix things the 
way they do here in America. Moshe was stunned by this admission, which he considered ignorant. What difference does it make? You want your business to succeed or not? But Malachi wasn't listening. He was staring at Nate and his men, who were busy moving chairs and tables, putting white cloths on the tables, setting up candles. He pointed to the back of the hall. Who is that boy? He asked. Moshe followed the direction of Malachi's finger that pointed to the lone Negro child among the men who were wiping tables near one of the exits. He was tall and thin for his age, not more than ten or twelve, Moshe. Guest, athletic, with long arms and neck, and skin that looked as if he'd been dipped into a vat of chocolate. He had a dark oval face, wide nose, high cheekbones, and the longest eyelashes of any child Moshe had ever seen. Beautiful, expressive eyes. The child was sweeping popcorn and candy wrappers off chairs with a whisk broom. He noticed them, smiled shyly, then ducked his head, hurrying back to work as Nate directed, the boy moving quickly, as if he wanted to disappear into the tables and chairs. Moshe watched, transfixed. He was accustomed to Negroes, disappearing, vanishing, and slipping off. But as he watched the Negro boy work his way across the littered dance floor, corralling the garbage, moving tables and chairs with speed and desperate efficiency, he felt a sudden gust of memory, as if his past had suddenly swept into the room and blew into the back of his shirt collar, like a breeze from an open door that puffs into an office and ruffles all the loose papers, sending them to the floor. He saw himself back in Romania at age nine, hungry and exhausted, standing outside a bread shop in Constanza, one terrified eye on the road watching for soldiers, the other eye on the baker's door, as Isaac burst out holding a loaf of harla under his arm like it was an American football, an old woman on his heels, as Isaac hissed, hurry, before the soldiers come. The two boys ran, gobbling the bread like wolves as they fled. No wonder he hated Harla. He looked away from the child to see Malachi staring at him. It's the strangest thing about Harla, Moshe said. Do you want to hear? No, why not? Because I know it's not my baking that you dislike, friend, Malachi said. It's what it stirs inside you, and for that I cannot help you. Only prayer can help that. Moshe's eyes widened. How could he know? What are you talking? about, he said, you are making up things, it's just bread, Malachi ignored that, instead, he pulled himself up so he could sit on the edge of the stage, his legs dangling off it, watching the negro boy work, among the line of men moving fast across the dance hall, he glanced at his watch, then at the boy, it's one o'clock, that child should be in school, Moshe shrugged, the boy's schooling wasn't his business, Nate brought him. Nate brings all my workers. Malachi's eyes grew sallow. Despondency climbed into his face as he watched the Negroes work. When I got off at Ellis Island, the first American one ever saw was a Negro. I thought all Americans were Negroes. Moshe laughed nervously. Conversations about race always made him uneasy. He tried to change the subject. I had never tasted a tomato until I came here, he said cheerily. I had never eaten a banana. When I did eat one, I didn't like it. But Malachi seemed distracted. He stared at the boy, watching him toss papers into a small can as he moved toward the back of the hall. That's what's wrong with this country, he said. The Negroes, Moshe shrugged. They've done nothing wrong. They're good friends. My Nate, his wife, Addie, the helpers they bring. They help me. A great deal. Malachi smirked. Did you know that all the historical sources of Hanukkah are in Greek? What's that got to do with my Negro workers? Light is only possible through dialogue between cultures, not through rejection of one or the other. Moshe chuckled and nodded at Nate, who had worked his way to the back of the hall, directing the kid. My Nate doesn't speak Greek. Your Nate. Does he belong to you? 
Moshe looked flummoxed. You know what I mean, he muttered. Malachi frowned. The American ways you've learned. He shook his head. This country is too dirty for me. What's wrong with you? Nate is my friend. Is he now? Of course. Because you pay him. Of course. Is he supposed to work for free? Moshe sputtered. But Malachi wasn't listening. He stared at Nate and at the boy working behind him and at the other Negroes. He watched them for several long moments, then murmured, I think the Negroes have the advantage in this country. How's that? At least they know who they are. He hopped down from the stage and began to gather his baker's tools. The rolling pin, the spatula, cramming them in the oversized pockets of his worn jacket, the tools clanking as he did so. When he next spoke, he spoke. In Yiddish, we are integrating into a burning house, he said. What are you talking about? Moshe demanded. Malachi turned to look at the back of the hall, his blue eyes following the Negroes. Suddenly one of them began to sing softly, a church hymn, and the others joined in. Moving in sync, working faster now, as they shifted tables and tossed garbage into barrels. I'll go where you want me to go. Oh, a mountain, plain, or sea. I'll say what you want me to say. Lord, I'll be what you want me to be. The song wafted up and across the dank, dark dance hall. Malachi listened a moment, then said in Yiddish, I would like you to sell my bakery for me. I will drop the papers off in the morning. If there is a prophet, please send it to me. Where are you going? But Malachi was already at a side door and was gone. Moshe watched the door close, puzzled. He glanced at the stage. Malachi had left several tools behind, a pie pan, a shaker. He thought, I'll give these things to him when I see him tomorrow. But he did not see Malachi the next day, or the next. He didn't see him again for three years. Chapter 7 a new problem. Month after Malachi left Pottstown, Moshe was inside the theater, moving tables on the dance floor after cleaning up the remnants of last night's blue sock hop starring Jay McShann when Nate put down his broom and approached Moshe. Can I have a word? Moshe almost didn't hear him. He was still troubled by Malachi's sudden disappearance. He had sent Nate over to the bakery a few days later, and Nate reported that the bakery was shut and the apartment overhead was dark. A few days after that, Moshe received a letter, postmarked Chicago. Then two days later, a second, postmarked Des Moines, Iowa, both in Malachi's beautiful cursive hand, giving instructions on the sale of the bakery, what should be done with all the tools and utensils, and where to send the money once the sale was complete. It was a headache Moshe was not anxious to get involved in. Moshe waited a week, hoping somehow that Malachi might change his mind, then he finally moved on Malachi's request. After he made a few inquiries, his father-in-law in Reading produced two Jewish brothers from Lithuania who were happy to buy the bakery. They were greenies, freshly arrived and not cognizant of American ways. It meant Moshe had to go down to City Hall and deal with the Goyim and their snide questions and puzzling forms. Isaac offered to send a Jewish lawyer from Reading to assist, but Moshe declined. He knew all the town employees. He could get it done quickly. Besides, Malachi was a friend even if he believed in things that he, Moshe, now that he was an American, did not. Malachi, he decided was part of the past. The old way simply didn't fit in America. Still, what Malachi had said bothered him. This country is too dirty for me, he'd said. How dare he? America was clean, 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 far cleaner than Europe. What's wrong with him, that he should speak this way about this great country? Look what it had done for him. It was what Malachi said about the Negro, however, that bothered Moshe. Most, I think the Negroes have the advantage in this country. At least they know who they are. That's ridiculous, 
Moshe had said. He looked up to find Nate staring at him. What's that for? Nate asked, staring down at Moshe's hand. Moshe found that he was holding a $10 bill. It was a tip he'd planned to give to Nate for his handling of the McShan band with his usual grace. He always tipped Nate. Nate was his man. He blankly held the money out. For you. Nate stared at him. You all right, Mr. Moshe. Moshe looked around the theater. At the back, two of Nate's workers, including the boy Malachi had noticed a month earlier, had returned. He nodded at the boy. Who's that? He asked. Nate's soft eyes smoothed into concern. That's who I come to talk to. You about. That there's my nephew, Dodo. What kind of name is that for a child? That's what we call him. He's a good boy. He's deaf and dumb. Well, not dumb. Feeble minded. Nate shrugged. No, he had an accident. Well, Addie's sisters. Stove blowed up one day and something got in his eye. He couldn't see out of it for a while and he still can't hear good. But he talks okay. Did you take him to Doc Roberts? Nate smiled. It was, Moshe noticed, a bitter smile. Doc Roberts marched every year in the local clan parade. It was Chona who had called him out about it. Her letters to the newspaper protesting the men who marched down Main Street in white sheets, forcing the Jewish merchants to close, caused more trouble than they were worth as far as Moshe was concerned. Then following it up with a letter pointing out the exclusion of Jews from the Potsdam Tennis Club and the ice skating rink, which the Potsdam Mercury was bold enough to print, didn't help. That caused a stir not just in the town but in the shul as well. Most of the 17 original Jewish families on Chicken Hill were German and liked getting along. But the newer Jews from Eastern Europe were impatient and hard to control. The Hungarians were prone to panic, the Poles grew sullen, the Lithuanians were furious and unpredictable, and the Romanians, well, that would be. Moshe, the sole Romanian, he did whatever his wife told him to do, even though they didn't agree on everything, but the relatively new Jewish newcomers were not afraid to fight back. They seemed to operate with the tacit understanding that while fights were bad for business, if the Jews of Potsdam quit their jobs and businesses, Potsdam would break down in about five minutes. Chona, an American-born Bulgarian, had clout, her American pedigree giving her status with the highbrow Jews at social service agencies who looked down the noses at their newer Jewish brethren who arrived in smelly clothes fresh off the boat speaking only Yiddish. Her father had started the shul. Her husband was the richest merchant in town even though he trafficked in Yiddish plays and nigger shows, and her husband's cousin was the biggest theater owner in Philadelphia with contacts all the way to Hollywood. Isaac's appearance at the Chevry, where he defended Moshe's decision to open his theater to the colored, had gone a long way, so no one challenged her openly. Chona was a cripple anyway. Who could argue with a cripple? Let her rant, they seemed to say, but the town's older Jews observed her movements with fearful watchfulness. Her illness complicated matters, because Chona refused to allow Doc Roberts to treat her. He was the town's pride, a hometown boy made good, and the story of her long trips to doctors in far-off places was an embarrassment. Doc Roberts had even sent word that he would come up to the hill to see her and had been ignored. Moshe sought to avoid the confrontation by claiming that Chona's illness required specialists, which was to some degree true, if there had been a diagnosis. But there was none, really. Her turnaround came, she was happy to tell people, when Malachi showed up and prayed for her out of his thick magza. And wouldn't you know it, she declared, the poor man didn't last five minutes in Potsdam. Because people did not support him. Now he's out somewhere healing the world. Potsdam be damned. And we are stuck with Doc Roberts marching in his silly white clown costume every year. Where did he learn to be a doctor anyway? Moshe heard these things at his house and thanked his lucky stars that 
Chona's physical troubles made going downtown difficult, but that still did not solve the Doc Roberts problem. He was sorry every time the subject of Doc came up. Nate, as if to affirm the trouble, immediately dismissed the Doc Roberts. Suggestion. Dodo don't need no doctor, he said. He had an accident. He got sick. Then he got better. He's all right. So what's the problem? Moshe asked. Nate's hand slid nervously on the broom handle as he spoke. I've been meaning to ask you if it's okay to bring him round to help out. Cheer up. The tide and all. You can bring whomever you want, Moshe said. Yes, but I wonder if I could, as they say, get your blessing on the matter. Moshe looked at the youngster, who drifted closer, cleaning the floor. He was a beautiful boy. He had the smoothest, most glowing dark skin Moshe had ever seen. He shone like a light. Moshe smiled at him. The youngster glanced at him, then looked away, busying himself with picking up trash. A thought struck Moshe and he recalled Malachi's words about the boy. He glanced at his watch. It was nearly 1 p.m. How old is he? Round, about 10. Isn't he supposed to be in school? Nate leaned on his broom. Well, that's just it, Nate said. Dodo's, Addie's sister Thelma's boy. Remember Thelma? Moshe faintly remembered a quiet Negro woman Nate had called on. From time to time to help in the theater. I think so. Thelma got her wings last month. Got her wings. Passed away. Oh. Nate's brow furrowed and his old hands moved up and down the broom. Handle slowly. He said softly. Me and my wife's got him. Moshe looked down at the floor a moment. Embarrassed. It rarely occurred to him that he and Nate shared one commonality. Neither of their wives could bear children. They had worked in the theater all day side by side for twelve years but rarely discussed their wives or matters of home. Why bother? Their wives did all the talking anyway. Chona's illness had shaken them all, and her recovery had given them something to be happy about. Or did it? He realized then that he'd always avoided asking Nate about his home life. It was better that way, a throwback to his own fuzzgear. Childhood when he befriended children whose families joined the theater troupe, and then one day the friends suddenly departed, some were adopted. Others carried off by sickness, disease, bad luck, death, or, in rare cases, opportunity. Food was scarce. Life was cheap. A Jew's life in the old country was worthless. Better to not make friends at all. How dare Malachi call this country dirty? It was so much better here. Well, I think that's fine, Moshe said. You can run things as you like. Nate's brow furrowed. A man from the state come to the house last week. Says he's gonna carry Dodo off to a special school over in Spring City. Dodo don't wanna go to no special school. He's all right here with us. Moshe's heart quickened. He felt a request coming, but Nate continued. The man says he's coming back to fetch him next week. I'm wondering if you might let me slip Dodo into the theater here tonight, just for a few days. Till the man goes away. The boy's quiet. Can't hear nothing. Won't be scared or make no noise. He can work good, clean up and so forth. For how long? Just a couple of days till the man's gone. But there's nowhere to sleep, Moshe protested. It's too cold. He can sleep in the basement. We got a couch down there and the old brick fireplace. He'll be all right. What about the man from the state? The government ain't gonna trouble theself too much about a lil' old colored boy, Mr. Moshe. Moshe felt a flash of fear well up inside at the mention of the word. Government. The USA. The law. Only the thought of Addy standing over. His wife, Addy's tears falling from her face, tending to Chona long after. Chona slept, waking up in his chair and still seeing Addy there in the morning, fighting off the sickness, fighting off the devil that was trying to deprive him of the love of the woman who had given him so much. Only that image gave him the courage to ignore the naked terror that surged in his throat and across his spine as he uttered, I have to talk to my missus. 
Nate. All right then. But Moshe already knew the answer even as he walked into his kitchen. That night, he hadn't expected a different answer, really, for Chona had no fear of the government. When her father had moved to Reading and had insisted that Moshe sell his theater and move to be near him, Chona insisted. They stay behind. We are building our own future, she said. Unlike Moshe, who was terrified of the police, Chona was unafraid to challenge them. When the farmer whose well was closest to the synagogue refused to sell water to the shul for the women's monthly ritual bath, Chona called the police. When the police refused to act, claiming that the cars could not make it up the dirt roads of the hill, she walked to the station and gave them a piece of her mind about the matter. Then, without asking anyone in the shul, she hired a colored man with a horse and cart, rode in the back as the man drove the cart to town, filled barrels from the town's water spigot herself, and had the colored man walk the barrels into the unoccupied mikvah and pour the water into the baths. The leaders of the shul were so outraged they threatened to drop Moshe and Chona from the rolls. The bad feelings lasted years, the upshot being that Moshe was certain that when he and Chona died, they would not be buried in the shul cemetery next to her. Grandparents who had preceded them but on a slender slice of Jewish land, owned by the shtetl near Hanover Street next to the cemetery used by the town's colored and poor. Chona shrugged it off. When I was dying, where were they? She chuckled. Busy trying to make a dollar change pockets is where they were. They call me the Kolyeke, the sick one. I'll outlast them all. When he walked into the house that night, Moshe found her standing over the stove cooking gefilte fish and onions, and humming to herself. He told her the little deaf boy's mother had died, how Nate and his Addy had taken him in, and how he had allowed the boy to sleep in the basement of the All-American Dance Hall and Theater that night so the state government couldn't take him away from the only family he had. Chona had her back to him, stirring the pot with one hand, with the other, leaning on the countertop to keep her balance. She glanced at him over her shoulder, and one look at her bright, shining eyes clouded in irritation told him everything. Then she turned to her pot and spoke with her back to him. What's the matter with you? She said, I said yes. You sent him to sleep in the cold theater basement, with the rats. There's a stove down there. Nate and I fired it for him. So, it's trouble, Chona. The government wants him. For what? To put him in a special place. What kind of place? A place for children like him. He could see, and almost feel, the back of her neck redden. She was silent a moment, then said, children like him. She said it in Yiddish, which meant she was mad. But I allowed it, he said. I even had Nate put some extra coals in the stove to keep it warm. You think because a child can't hear he's not cold at night. You think he's not afraid of the dark. You think he's happy to sleep in a cold theater. You think because his ears don't work he doesn't feel cold or lonely or that his heart doesn't break for his mother. You think that I run a theater, Moshe said. What do I know about children? Chona tapped the spoon on the edge of the pot, placed it on the stove, and spoke over her shoulder. Go put that fire out and bring him home. Chapter 8 Paper Hona's decision to hide Dodo from the state of Pennsylvania wasn't even the lead story when Patty Millicent, known as Newspaper Paper, for short, held court inside Chona's Heaven and Earth grocery store that following Saturday. Paper, whose smooth dark chocolate brown skin, perky breasts, slim buttocks, and wild cornrowed hair was appended by her running mouth that could keep neither secret nor food, for she ate like a horse but never gained an ounce, was a laundress who held court inside the heaven and earth grocery store every Saturday. Saturday was Miss Chona's Sabbath, which gave paper free reign to trade quips, juicy gossip, and other vital local information out of Chona's hearing.
the colored maids, housekeepers, saloon cleaners, factory workers, and bellhops of Chicken Hill who gathered near the vegetable bin each Saturday morning to hear papers. News, however, loved her chatter. Paper knew more news than the local papers, which she actually never read. In fact, there was a rumor about that. Paper couldn't read at all. She'd been seen at the Second Baptist Church, holding the hymnal book upside down more than once. That didn't matter. Her neat wooden frame house on Franklin Street was perched at one of the main roads leading up to Chicken Hill, giving her a view of the town in front and the hill in the back. Still, it wasn't the location of her home that allowed paper to serve as the source of the most intrepid reports on the hill, or her being as capable as the most able reporter from the nimble Potsdam, Mercury or even the mighty Philadelphia Bulletin. Rather, it was her effect on the male species, her beauty, her easy laughter, glimmering eyes, and instant smile for every stranger she met, made her a magnet for men. Men spilled the guts to her, hardened thugs who gutted one another with knives, in alleyways watched her sidle down the muddy roads of the hill in the afternoon and felt a sudden urge to repent, recalling the innocence of their childhood, the glorious yellow sunlight that kissed their faces when they burst out of church after Sunday school in shirt and tie on Palm Sunday, whirling palm fronds in the air as their mothers laughed, mild-mannered, deacons who sat on their porches with grim faces after toiling all day as smiling waiters in white jackets at the Potsdam Social Club serving meals. To the town's white fathers watched Paper's proud breasts swing freely beneath her dress as she floated past and suddenly heard the sound of a thousand drums pounding down the Amazon, accompanied by visions of drowning their bosses. Bricklayers paved her chimney just to watch her bend over the petunias in her gloriously full-flowered yard. Mule skinners hauled barrels of drinking water to her house just to hear the sound of her laughter. Pullman Porter royalty from the nearby Reading Railroad floated by her porch regularly to drop off laundry and tell high stories about travels to far-off places like Iowa and Florida and even Los Angeles, dreaming of doing the bunga bunga with paper, whom they saw as the wild local. White men found her irresistible, which is why she held no lucrative maid's job. I'm retired from day's work, she told friends with a laugh. Too much trouble. The men grope and the women mope. White housewives from town who wanted their husbands to climb the greasy pole of opportunity in Potsdam's thriving banking and manufacturing worlds made a steady trek to Paper's house bearing their husband's laundry, for she washed with such thoroughness and ironed with such professional skill that even Willard Milston Potts, the town's chief banker, grandson of Mr. John Potts, himself, the old fart who lay in the graveyard gathering worms, thank God parachuted over to hell even if the bridge was out, the old black folks prayed, sent his shirts to her house to have them cleaned and pressed. Paper, as the old folks said, had turned talent. Women found her funny and interesting, for unlike most men, she was curious about their opinions, was yet to be married, and swore she had no plans to. I can do better without a man, she declared, which made her high cotton and one up on the chicken. Hill's most respected stateswoman, Addie, Nate's wife, who was a Townsend, and everyone knew those Townsends were too bold to live long. Anyway, they'd been out of the South too long. Too black, too strong, too bold. They refused to step off the sidewalk when a white woman approached. They forgot to avoid looking a white person in the eye. They forgot all the behaviors that, back home, could have you seeing your life flashing before your eyes as a noose was lowered around your neck, or worse, staring at iron bars for twenty years with your hopes flatter than yesterday's beer, dreaming about old junk that you should have sold, or dear, you should have shot but missed, or women you should have married and didn't, having wandered face first into the five-fingered karate chop of the white man's laws. 
A colored person couldn't survive in the white man's world being ignorant. They had to know the news. That's why paper was so important. She was a Potsdam special. Thus, when she decided that the lead story in her Saturday morning announcements at Chona's Heaven and Earth grocery store had nothing to do with Miss Chona's decision to hide Dodo from the man from the state. Not one of the group of housewives, bums, and factory janitors standing about questioned it. Everybody knew Dodo was doomed anyway. He was Addie's nephew, the child of her late sister, Thelma, who died three years after a stove in her house blew up and took the boy's ears away. The special school, which everybody knew wasn't a school at all but rather the horrific Penhurst sanatorium up the road in Spring City was just another injustice in a world full of them, so why dwell on it? Plus, papers gossip that Saturday was too juicy to ignore. She rolled it out like this. Big Soap knocked Fatty's gold tooth out. Big Soap was a relative newcomer and a hill favorite, a huge Italian. Named Enzo Carasimi, six feet six, majestically built with wide shoulders. Huge hands, alluring brown eyes, and a gentle nature, who was constantly bursting into laughter. He had emigrated from Sicily to America at twelve, with his extended family, one of the few white families still on the hill. Fatty Davis, a clever, stout, two-fisted, gregarious hustler who owned the Hill's only juke joint, was also twelve then, and the two became fast friends. Fatty happily served as Big Soap's translator and English tutor, the two sharing a love of building and hustling up dollars. After graduating from high school, they worked at several plants together, the most recent being Flag Industries in nearby Stowe, which made steel nipples and fittings for steam pipes. They often walked home from work together. Paper's announcement quickly drew a crowd. Rusty, standing at the edge of the group, received the news with disbelief. You telling what you seen, Paper, or what somebody told you. Paper's huge brown eyes landed on Rusty, whose lean frame tensed as. Paper's eyes took him in. Rusty, she said patiently, I seen soap knock out Fatty's tooth, okay, with my own eyes, yesterday, how come I ain't heard nothing from Fatty about it, I was over to his juke last night, doing what, that's my business, did you see Fatty last night, I wasn't looking for him, I was taking care of some business, well, whatever that business was, Fatty wasn't in it, cause he drove to Philly last night to get his lip fixed. His top lip had swolled up to the size of a hot dog. The women standing in the circle laughed. Addie, working the far end of the counter near the back of the store, drifted over to listen. Were they drinking? She asked. I don't think so, Paper said. Rusty smirked. How do you know? You smell their breath. Paper tipped her head and gazed at him sedately. Rusty was handsome she thought, but he looked terrible when he smirked. She wondered if he knew how good he looked when he remained calm as opposed to making those stupid faces. She decided he didn't. He was, after all, like most men, a moron. What you got against me, Rusty? Paper asked coolly. Rusty, standing with his hands in his overall pockets, reached for his cigarettes and suddenly couldn't remember which pocket they were in. He felt about his overalls, finding himself short of breath. He always felt like this when paper was around. All this who shot John nonsense don't mean nothing unless you've seen the whole thing, paper. You've seen it all. Only the end, she said. Which was, I just said it. Soap popped him, still patting himself for his cigarettes. Rusty gave up and dropped his hands in his pockets feeling as if something had slipped away. He heard himself plead, come on, paper, story it up like you know how. Put a little pop in it, a little scoop, you know. Why should I? Cause if you tell it any other way, it'll sound like a lie. For the first time, paper softened a bit and smiled. Rusty, she had to confess, had some curve in him. 
he had an innocence about him, and, despite the loose-fitting overalls, his muscled arms and firm chest gave her. In it's a kind of shove, one she hadn't felt in years, not since she was. 17 and took her first and last bus ride out of Vestavia, Alabama. North to points unknown. I hear your Aunt Clemmie's bringing her cheese cookies to the repast after. Church tomorrow. She calls, M. Cheese Straws. I don't care if she calls, M. George Washington. If she brings, M. Will. You remember your friends. I might. Satisfied and now with a full audience, paper launched in. I was weeding in my garden when I seen Fatty and Soap come up the hill from work. They stopped a few feet from my yard and Fatty said, go head, Soap, do it. I know you wanna go ahead, do it, get it over with. Quote, here she demonstrated, sticking out her lower jaw, her body curving, with her back arched. This drew laughter from the crowd, which now included several new customers who wandered in, Stranger Coloreds from nearby Hemlock Row, Phoenixville, and Stowe, a few day laborers who lived at White Farms outside town and came to heaven and earth on weekends to enjoy the sights and sounds. Paper, glancing at her audience, had to work to keep the smile off her face as she continued, you know how soap is, he wouldn't hurt a fly, he said, I ain't gonna do it, fatty. But Fatty kept on him, saying, go, head, go, head, get it over with, quote, and here her eyes sparkled and she stood up straight, her beautiful face, shining in the sunlight that glowed into the store window, the light bouncing, off the fruit and vegetables and cascading into the corners of the heaven and earth grocery store, illuminating the peppers and carrots, the saltines and apple peelers, making life seem as full and new and fresh as the promise of. Pennsylvania had once been for so many of those standing about who had come up from the south to the north, a land of supposed good, clean freedom, where a man could be a man and a woman could be a woman. Instead of the reality where they now stood, a tight cluster of homes, enclosed by the filth of factories that belched bitter smoke into a grey sky and tight yards filled with goats and chickens in a part of town no one wanted, in homes with no running water or bathrooms, living like they were down home, except they weren't down home, they were up home, and it was the same, but moments like this made life worthwhile, for paper, was a banging drum, and rolling out rumors and news chatter was her, gospel song, always melodious and joyful, she stood among them, her eyes glistening. Soap didn't want to give in, but Fatty kept knocking at him, saying, go, head, Soap. I'm a man, go, head, you could see the idea kind of hit Soap, she said. It kind of, growed on him, and with Fatty pushing him along, I reckon his mind told him it was okay, and here she chuckled, so he balled up his fist, and I mean that white boy reached back and sent that big fist of his rambling through four or five states before it said hello to fatty it started in mississippi gone up through the carolinas stopped for coffee in virginia picked up steam coming out of maryland and boom he liked to part fatty from this world it landed on fatty's face something terrible i can still hear the sound of it knocked fatty clean off his feet and sent the gold tooth of his the front one sent that tooth. Rambling. Then, Rusty asked. Weren't no then, Rusty, she said. Soap turned and went on home. And, Fatty sat there on his poop hole. After he figured out his head was still on his shoulders, he got up and started crawling round on his hands and knees. Like a dog pooping a bone. And what did you do the whole time? Rusty asked. What you think? I went out there. You did not. Show nuff. I come out my yard and said, Fatty what's the matter? He, said, my gold tooth's gone. It took us a good while searching round in the, dirt, but we found it. That put a little dip in his stride, putting that thing in, his pocket. He walked off with a hole in his teeth the size of Milwaukee. Rusty and the others laughed, 
and when the cackling died down, Paper stuck a toothpick in her mouth. Dick Clemens, who works over at Flags, he come by later and told me what happened. Turns out some big shot. Inspector had come out there. He's a top dog. Shows up twice a year from Philly. They got to spick and span the whole place when he comes. Wash down everything. The machines, the windows, the trusses, the posts, all the gadgets. Got to give the beauty treatment to everything. Well, Fatty had just got a promotion over there, and Soap was under him. They were a team, but Fatty got too big for his britches. He got high, Sidity ordering that white boy around. He had Soap doing all the work, while he sat around napping. She paused, surveying the crowd, and out of instinct glanced at the empty chair at the far end of the counter where Miss Chona normally sat. Lording over the sweets, the chair was empty. When the big inspector come to the room where Fatty and Soap was, he pointed to one of the fire hoses hanging on the wall and said, Has this fire hose been taken out and tested? Fatty told him, Yes sir, it's been tested. Who tested it? Well, Soap here, Fatty said. Soap didn't know any more about testing a fire hose than a hog knows a holiday. But being Italian and not speaking English too good, he saw Fatty nodding, so he said, I, I, C, C, or however the Italians say yes. So the inspector pulled the hose off the rack and shook it. A peanut dropped out the nozzle. He said, I put that peanut in there six months ago. When I was here before, Fatty said, but it's a clean peanut, sir. Well, that big cheese got mad and fired them both on the spot. On the way home, I reckon Fatty wanted to clear things, since he knew Soaps. Mama will whip Soap Bowlegged for losing his job. You know how Soaps Mama is. That little lady'll put that giant into a condition. She'll clean his ass up, the crowd guffaw, and as they dispersed, several remarked that Fatty rascal that he was, just had too many jobs, is what it was. He drove a cab. He had a laundry service. He worked at the plant. Plus ran his juke joint and hamburger stand. Others speculated that poor Big Soap felt he owed Fatty. Since Fatty had taken him down to join the Empire Fire Company before. They worked at Flag and introduced him to the Irishman down there who. Sat around drinking beer and playing cards all day while making Big Soap. Wash the company's new fire truck and pull the company's old horse pulled. Fire wagon around the station just to prove to them he belonged, being that. He was the first Italian in the fire company's history. Big Soap just had the wrong kind of friends, they all agreed. As the crowd chatted, Paper drifted away to the back counter where Addie stood. She waited until the crowd drifted far enough away so that she could not be heard easily then leaned over the counter. Give me a packet of BC powder, she said casually, pointing over. Addie's shoulder. Addie reached behind her, grabbed the item, and tossed it on the counter. Her eyes flitted left to the door near the vegetable stand, stopping on a tall negro stranger in a white shirt and felt cap who stood over the vegetables, pretending to regard the onions. Paper glanced at him, then draped her long pretty fingers around the headache powder. You got a headache, paper? Addie asked. No, but that nigger's gonna have one. It was all I could do to not tell. Rusty about him. Rusty would beat the tar out of him. Maybe he's from Hemlock Row. No, the Hemlock Row colored are shorter, the heads are different, and they favors one another. He's from the state. The state ain't got no colored workers, Addie said. Maybe he's a Pullman Porter. If he's a Pullman Porter, I'll eat him without salt. Look at them shoes. What kind of Porter would be caught dead wearing them raggedy ass shoes? Plus, I know every Porter that comes through here. I'm thinking maybe he's a state man. Might be from the Penhurst Nuthouse. Sent to fetch Dodo. A colored. Colored don't do nothing but clean the floor and cheer up. The tide out at Penhurst, to my knowing. All the same. He could be. How? We gonna know for sure. Paper thought a moment, then said, Miggy Flood, 
from Hemlock Grove. She knows every colored up there. She might know who he is. Addy watched the man, then glanced away, worried. The state sent a white fella out here to fetch Dodo three times. Same man. You must really hit his button when you run him off. I ain't run him off. Miss Jonah run him off. Well, she set him off, Paper said. The two watched as the man swiveled his head around quickly, looking through the crowded store and glancing around, then moved from the onions over to the okra, fingering one, then another. Paper smirked, that's something. I never met a colored who worked for the state before. You want me to chat him up? No, Addy said. He got to pass your house when he leaves. If he's driving a car, write down the license number. Paper chuckled. I'm allergic to that. I can write a few wee old letters on a page here and there, but that's it. You want me to tell Fatty? Fatty can straighten him out. I thought you said Fatty went to Philly to see about his tooth. He'll be back. Leave him out of it. What about Miss Chona? Paper asked. Keep her out of it, too, for God's sake. She ain't in as good a shape as she looks. If she finds out who he is, she might cuss him out. Or worse, fall ill on account of it, which'll stir up more trouble with the white folks. They, about as fond of her round here as they're of peanut shells. Just keep it quiet. Addy rubbed her jaw for a moment, then leaned on the counter, moving a bit closer to paper. One thing, she said, her voice lower. Miss Chona told the man from the state three times the boy ain't in these parts no more. Why they still looking? Cause somebody on the hill is running their mouth, Paper said. How are we gonna find the blabbermouth? Paper smiled, and her gorgeous eyes lit a shade of near green with anticipation. Leave that to me, she said. 